Looking for magic cards? Channel Fireball offers a wide selection of magic singles and sealed product. You can now use the promo code LVD at checkout. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to this special limited set review for Corset 2021. We will be using a letter grade rating for all the cards. So just to give you some reference of what I mean by these ratings, if we reference Ikoria, cards that I give an S rating, so this is the absolute top tier of rares and cards that can carry a game by themselves. Vivian, Monster's Advocate, was a prime example of an S tier level card in Ikoria. Then taking a look at the A's, these are still bomb level cards that can easily win a game by themselves. Thinking of Ikoria, we had uh, cards like Dirge Bat, Extinction Event, Shark Typhoon, Cub Warden. So those are all very powerful cards as well. Then at B, we find the very efficient removal spells and above average rate creatures. So in that category, I would put uh, Dreamtail Heron, Blood Curdle, Heartless Act. We've got cards like Porky Parrot, Flame Spill. So efficient removal spells and above average creatures. And then at C+, we find cards that very rarely get cut from a deck. So these are your still above average cards for sure. We find some conditional removal spells at C+, as well. Cards like Essence Scatter, Capture Sphere, cards like Bushmeat Poacher, Pyroceratops that can grow over time, Spell Eater Wolverine, that's quite good if you can enable it. So even some of the more conditional creatures, if you can enable them, can fall in the C plus category. The vast majority of cards will fall under the C category. So these are just fine playables that will make up most of your deck, but that doesn't mean that they're particularly exciting. Thinking of Ikoria, at C we find cards like Bristling Boar, we find Ferocious Tigerilla, Helica Glider, for instance. And then at D we find cards that more often than not will not make the final cut in the deck. Some of the more conditional uh, cards Cards like Shredded Sails that could still see play because they found a home in the cycling deck, but it's not particularly exciting. Same with Wilt or uh, Pump Spells like Fully Grown that uh, are not particularly efficient, but every now and then you might still play them. And then there's not a whole lot of F-level cards in Ikoria. I struggle to find one, but uh, I can probably point towards Titan's Nest as an F. You'll struggle to find an example of a deck that should include it. So that's kind of my uh, card rating here. Moving into our review of course at 2021, so you've got a bit of a frame of reference from our previous expansion. So yeah, now let's get to it. As we go over the cards here, we'll start with the multicolor cards, just because they tend to give you a better idea of what the archetype's all about. So by taking a look at the different color pairs, we will have a better understanding of the things that those color pairs are trying to accomplish within the expansion. So without further ado, we'll start with Alpine Houndmaster. A red and a white for a 2-2 human warrior, and when the Houndmaster enters the battlefield you may search your library for a card named Alpine Watchdog and or a card named Igneous Cur. Reveal them and put them into your hand, and then when the Houndmaster attacks, it gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is the number of other attacking creatures. So a pretty solid card overall. Of course, it is a bit of a build around. If you're just uh, evaluating the Houndmaster by itself without any additional creatures to search up, it's uh, still a playable card for sure, but gets a lot less exciting than if you do have a few creatures to find with them. So both of them are playable if unexciting, but of course, if you've got the Houndmaster in the deck, then uh, they become much more appealing to include. They're also both dogs, so they could potentially have some dog synergies, which the Houndmaster can then enable as well. So just something to keep in mind as we evaluate the Houndmaster. So at the end of the day, I would probably land somewhere around a B for the Alpine Houndmaster especially if you can uh, grab a couple of those Alpine Watchdogs and Igneous Curse. And uh, yeah, of course fits nicely into a more aggressive deck that's prone to attacking with multiple creatures. But uh, Alpine Houndmaster, not a bad one. Conclave Mentor, a green and a white for a 2-2 Centaur Cleric. 
If one or more plus one plus one counters would be put on a creature you control, that many plus one counters plus one additional one are put on that creature instead. And when the mentor dies, you gain life equal to its power. So the green-white color pair is trying to synergize a bit with plus one plus one counters, as we'll see when going over the green and white cards. And the mentor is a great payoff for doing so, kind of reminiscent of the Winding Constrictor from uh, Ether Vault, which definitely saw a ton of play and was uh, quite a powerhouse. So the Conclave Mentor definitely has a lot going for it. It's a 2-2 by itself, so it's not horrible, and when it dies, gains a bit of life as well. So there's a lot to like about the Conclave Mentor. So at the end of the day, I would probably fall somewhere in the B, B plus range even. So I will sometimes go outside of the bounds of my uh, ratings here if uh, I feel like the card's just a little bit better than what the rating would be otherwise. So if I sometimes give a B plus or B minus rating, for instance, and don't get too upset. So Conclave Mentor for me is going to be a B plus. And Dire Fleet Warmonger, one a black and a red for a 3-3 Orc Pirate. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, the Warmonger gets plus two plus two and gains trample until end of turn. So in a lot of the previous expansions, red-black has been the sacrifice color, and it's no different here. Now, there's not a ton of active treason effects in the set. There's one at Uncommon that I've seen. So don't expect to have a ton of active treasons in your deck to synergize with the Warmonger, but you will still have in black and red some small expendable creatures that you don't mind sacrificing to the Warmonger to synergize with them. So at the end of the day, it's still a 3-mana 3-3 with upside, so we should evaluate it like that. But it does point towards a sacrifice theme in Rakdos. And uh, yeah, the Warmonger is still a pretty good card. I would probably land on a B for the Dire Fleet Warmonger. Pretty good card. Experimental Overload. To a blue and a red for a sorcery. That creates an XX, a blue and red weird creature token where X is the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard. And then you may return an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand and exile the Experimental Overload. So this is an interesting one. You want to be a heavy instant and sorcery focused deck, which, you know, Izzet tends to be. But uh, that doesn't mean that every Izzet deck is going to have a multitude of instant and sorceries, especially by the time you want to cast Overload. So let's say you've cast one or two additional instant and sorceries before the Overload. You get a 2-2 weird token and you get to return one of those cards back to your hand. It's not a bad deal. Kind of reminds me of Archaeomancer, uh, which was like a 4-mana 1-2 that returned an instant or sorcery from your graveyard back to your hand. And um, that was definitely a, a card that was quite decent in its uh, limited format. So Overload is kind of on the same level, I would say. We had in a recent core set a 5-mana 2-2 that returned an instant or sorcery from the graveyard back to your hand. So that's also somewhat comparable to the Overload. Of course, if it's very much in the late game, you could potentially get a much bigger weird token, but it's no guarantee that you get a creature. Sometimes you don't have any whatsoever, and then Overload is a dead card. So we have to factor that in as well. So I'm not super high on the Experimental Overload, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's not going to be decent in a dedicated blue-red spells deck, but I would probably land somewhere on a C for Experimental Overload but it definitely has more upside in a deck that's dedicated to the instant and sorcery theme. Next up we have Indulging Patrician. One, a black and a white for a 1-4 Vampire Noble with flying and lifelink, and at the beginning of your end step, if you gained three or more life this turn, each opponent loses three life. So pretty pesky, annoying, uh, evasive creature that can pack in for a couple points of damage, gain a bit of life, and if you manage to combine it with other life gain synergies, it can potentially start dealing quite a bit more damage, making the opponent lose 3 life. And 4 toughness is not that easy to get rid of, so it's a pretty good blocker as well. So the Patrician seems like a pretty good card, and black White usually always has a couple life gain synergies, so the Patrician is a nice payoff as well as an enabler at the same time. So I'm liking the Patrician quite a bit. I would probably end somewhere around a B for Indulging Patrician. Pretty solid card. 
a Leafkin Avenger, to a red and a green for a 4-3 Elemental Druid, taps to add green for each creature we control with power 4 or greater, presumably the Avenger is one of them, and then for 8 mana, 7 and a red, the Leafkin Avenger deals damage equal to its power to target player or planeswalker, so if we don't enhance the Avenger in any other way we're dealing 4 damage to target player or planeswalker. So the Avenger is an interesting card. For 4 mana you typically don't really want mana creatures, you're more interested in adding a lot of power and toughness to the board, but we do still get a 4-3 for 4 mana which is not a bad deal, and then the ability to add green mana for each creature with power 4 or greater does contribute towards the activated ability, so if we do ever end up in a board stall situation the Avenger is a pretty good way to close out the game. And in red-green, as we'll see, there's quite a few synergies for having creatures with power 4 or greater. Um, maybe not quite a full uh, B, maybe closer to a B- minus on the Avenger, but uh, still definitely within the B range, and uh, definitely a playable card that incentivizes you to build around the 4-power theme, potentially. Next up we have a reprint with the Lore Scale Quadl, one a green and a blue for a 2-2 two -two snake, and whenever we draw a card, we put a plus one plus one counter on the quaddle. So a small creature, but it doesn't stay small, as it will start picking up counters pretty quickly, especially if you combine it with blue card draw spells, and it's just going to keep growing. And if you have any additional ways to give it evasion, maybe give it flying, then uh, it can definitely end the game in a hurry and potentially also comes with a couple plus one plus one counter synergies. We saw in green-white there's a bit of plus one counter synergy, so you could potentially have a bit of overlap if you're splashing blue or splashing white. And I think I'm leaning B plus on the Quaddle. Definitely a very threatening card that can get out of hand. Next up we have a rare with Nyambi, esteemed speaker. A blue and a white for a 2-1 legendary human cleric with flash. And when Yambi enters the battlefield, we may return another target creature we control to its owner's hand. And if we do, we gain life equal to that creature's converted mana cost. Alright, and then we have an activated ability for one, a blue and a white, tapping Yambi and discarding a legendary card in order to draw two. So in limited, the activated ability is probably not going to come up. Not that many legendary creatures in the set, it's not like... We're playing Dominaria, where we had a bunch of legendaries at Uncommon. So we can pretty much discount the activated ability here. So we're evaluating a 2 mana to 1 flash that can quote-unquote save one of our creatures and uh, gain a bit of life, which, you know, is a fine card. It's not a bomb level card, but it can potentially get a bit of value, especially useful when finding a deck that's playing a bunch of enchantment removal. And in the set we have, in white, a card like Faith's Feathers, which we'll see in a second. And in blue we have Capture Sphere as well, so there's a couple of these enchantment-based removal spells in the set. And uh, Nyambi can potentially uh, nullify those by returning creature back to our hand, and then we can just replay it, as well as getting a bit of life in the process. And sometimes, if you can afford to keep up two mana, you can also save your creature from a different removal spell by flashing in Nyambi in response but uh, it's not always going to be trivial to keep up 2 mana. So a fine card, I wouldn't rate Nyambi too highly, probably just a C+, plus, but uh, definitely a solid little card, and will complement a blue-white deck nicely. Next up we have Obsessive Stitcher, one a blue and a black, for an 0-3 human wizard, taps to draw a card and discard a card. We've seen these looting abilities pretty often, and uh, here we don't even have to pay any additional mana to draw and discard, so that's maybe a bit different from some of these similar creatures we've seen in recent sets, which usually came with an additional cost associated. And then we have an additional ability for two, a blue and a black. We can tap the Stitcher and sacrifice it in order to return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield, so we can potentially reanimate a creature from our graveyard. So, pretty useful ability, especially in the late game, once we start drawing a few too many lands, we can just discard them with a Stitcher to keep drawing action, and if we ever end up with a very valuable creature in the graveyard, we can reanimate it. So, definitely a powerful card, and blue-black does tend to have a bit of graveyard and mill synergies to fill the graveyard even more, so the Stitcher synergizes with that as well. 
So I would probably end up with uh, a B on the Stitcher, just a very solid card that I'm happy to have in any deck that can cast it. And an O3 is also still a reasonable blocker, even if it's not going to hold off any giant creatures. And next up we have Rada, Heart of Keld, one a red and a green for a 3-3 legendary elf warrior, saying as long as it's our turn, Rada has first strike, alright. Keep going, we may look at the top card of our library anytime, and play land cards from the top of our library. Well, that's pretty exciting. We can uh, pretty easily get quite a bit of card advantage from Rada just by playing lands of the top. So it's easy to get value from that ability. And there's more. For 6 mana, Rana gets plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of lands we control. So we even get a mana sink to use all those extra lands. And it's a pretty powerful ability. I mean, with 6 mana, presumably we have 6 lands in play. So it gets plus 6 plus 6. Get in there for 9 first strike damage. That's a lot of damage. At the very least an A level card that can both provide card advantage, can uh, pressure the opponent's life total, and uh, it's still nice that we can play it early, so some bomb level cards are going to be pretty expensive to make up for their power level, but Rana comes out for just 3 mana, starts providing value right away, and in the late game has the very powerful activated ability as well, so it kind of does it all. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Rana, and I'm going to land on an A at the very least. And next up we have a Sanctum of All. So there are shrines in the set. Last time we saw shrines was with the Hondans in Kamigawa. This time we have a different set of shrines. And there's one rare shrine, Sanctum of All, that's uh, one of each color. A legendary enchantment shrine. And at the beginning of our upkeep, we may search our library and or graveyard for a shrine card and put it onto the battlefield. And if we search our library this way, shuffle it. And then if an ability of another shrine we control triggers while we control six or more shrines, that ability triggers an additional time. Now that second part is probably not going to happen very often, since the shrines are uncommons for the most part, I think. So the chances of having six or more of them in your deck are pretty slim and limited. But uh, the first ability could come up for sure if you've got a couple shrines that uh, no one else wants. So this is probably more of a meme deck than a serious deck that's going to be very competitive. But every once in a blue moon I could see the Sanctum deck coming together and uh, this being a nice centerpiece for it. So I don't recommend first picking it and drafting the Shrine deck, but I'm definitely going to try it first chance I get. So Sanctum of All, probably a D. Next up we have Twin Blade Assassins. 3 a black and a green for a 5-4 elf assassin at the beginning of our end step. If a creature died this turn, draw a card. So this only triggers at the beginning of our end step, so it doesn't count the opponent's turn. But still we get a 5 mana 5-4, five which is not embarrassing, and then can easily provide a bit of card advantage as well. So there's a lot to like about the Twin Blade Assassins, and it also points towards the Golgari's theme which involves creatures dying, which is nothing new for the Golgari. But uh, as we evaluate some of the black and green cards, we want to keep that in mind, because a Golgari color pair wants us to prioritize death and uh, synergies that have to do with creatures dying. So the Assassins will synergize with those as well. I like the Assassins quite a bit. It's a nice way of providing card advantage while still putting a relevant body on the board. So I would probably land on a B, B plus for the Twin Blade Assassins. Now here's a card that's very impressive. Watcher of the Spheres, a blue and a white for a 2-2 bird wizard with flying, saying creature spells with flying we cast cause one generic mana less to cast. And whenever another creature with flying enters a battlefield under our control, Watcher of the Spheres gets plus one plus one until end of turn. That's a lot of uh, abilities on a 2 mana 2 2 flyer which generally is already very good and this just has all these additional benefits the ability to discount flyers something we've seen on warden of evo's isle which was already a pretty good card and here we get it on a 2 mana 2 2 instead of a 3 mana 2 2 and then playing additional flyers will pump up the watcher of the spheres as well so i'm a huge fan of watcher of the spheres 
blue white flyers is always a very solid archetype and limited and i don't expect it to be any different in corsa 21 so watch for the spheres i think i'm even willing to give this an a just because it's so efficient and uh, can lead to some very explosive starts with a lot of evasive creatures that are typically very hard to deal with in limited so probably the best out of the two color multicolor cycle at uncommon all right now we get to the artifacts and we start with a doozy here chromatic orrery seven mana legendary artifact at mythic we may spend mana as though it were mana of any color taps to add five colorless mana which of course translates into any color and then for five mana we can tap the orrery to draw a card for each color among permanents we control so a very flashy mythic but at the end of the day once we have seven mana we typically don't need even more ramp so that part of the card is kind of unnecessary and then we are paying seven mana to play the orrery and then we need five additional mana to start drawing our first card so this is painfully slow card advantage so unless the matchup we're playing is the grindiest of uh, grind fests it's probably not a card we can afford to play realistically but uh definitely a fun card to try and build around and construct it but for limiteds i would probably end on a d it's not completely unplayable and uh, probably gets better in sealed as opposed to draft where things tend to be a little bit slower but uh yeah i don't expect this to uh end up in most of my decks but uh, definitely a fun card next up we have chrome replicator five mana for a four four construct at uncommon and when the replicator enters a battlefield if you control two or more non-land non-token permanents with the same name as one another create a four four colorless construct artifact creature token so if we don't meet the requirements we get a five mana four four which is nothing to write home about but if we do meet the requirements we get eight power and toughness for just five mana which is a, a pretty good deal so the replicator will definitely require you to build around it because otherwise it's not really worthwhile but if you do manage to build around it successfully the payoff is pretty huge at the very least a c plus and i could easily see it overperforming next up we have the epitaph golem a five mana three five golem this is a reprint from uh, shadows over innistrad and for two mana we can put targets card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library so in shadows of over innistrad you had this big self mill theme where you could often end up with uh, a very full graveyard and then the golem could give you a lot of card selection by putting certain cards on the bottom of your deck there is not really the same self mill theme here in Corsa 21 as there was in Shadows over Innistrad in blue there's a few mill cards in black there's a few self mill cards but uh, generally speaking there's not a huge self mill theme the same way there was in Shadows over Innistrad so it's definitely going to be worse than it was in the uh, previous expansion so a 5 mana 3 5 that can make sure that in the late game you don't uh, end up decking and maybe if you have a bit of self mill it can end up giving you a bit of card selection too so it's definitely more of a build around card you're not going to put this in any old deck still not a an insanely high pick so it probably end up at a c for the epitaph golem but uh does have some interesting applications and can potentially be built around to take advantage of the ability forgotten sentinel is a four mana common golem it's a 4-3 and it enters a battlefield tapped so nothing fancy going on here um, not a particularly powerful card but it does serve a purpose if you just need a curve filler at four mana it's also four power for potentially the four power matters theme in red green so if you need a few additional four powered creatures to round out that deck you could potentially do worse than the sentinel so not an exciting card but not a an unplayable card either so probably give it d plus c minus somewhere in that region maze mind tome is a two mana rare artifact and we can tap it to put a page counter on it and scry one so we can do that without paying any mana 
but if we pay two mana and tap it and put a page counter on it, we get to draw a card instead. And when there are four or more page counters on the tome, we have to exile it, and if we do, gain four life. So we have a limited amount of uses, but uh, we only invested two mana to begin with, and then potentially we get to scry four times, and then gain four life, or we can potentially draw some additional cards if we have spare mana. So the tomb seems quite good, and then uh, it's also a pretty flexible card, since you can choose how much mana you invest in it, and still get quite a bit of value turn after turn at a pretty low investment. I think I'm gonna end up giving this a B, pretty solid card, and uh, of course fits into any deck, so makes for an excellent first pick, as you will be able to slot this into any deck you end up drafting. Next up we have Meteorite, a 5 mana uncommon artifact that when it enters the battlefield deals 2 damage to any target and then taps to add 1 mana of any color. Now we have a similar problem here with the Meteorite as we had with the Chromatic Orrery, where once we get to 5 mana we probably don't need that much ramp anymore, so putting this ability to make mana on a 5 mana artifact is probably not ideal, although it can potentially fix for a certain color if you're splashing, so if you're playing some sort of 3 color deck splashing some expensive cards, I could see this being okay. And then 2 damage at 5 mana is pretty pricey, once you get to 5 mana dealing 2 damage is probably not going to take out a very relevant uh, threat, maybe a flying creature that could be low toughness but still give you some issues the meteorite can take out, pretty flavorful as well. But overall I wouldn't give this too high of a rating, but I could easily see including this in some multicolor decks that are trying to ramp into some expensive cards. So overall I would probably give this a D. And then we have Palladium Mirror, a 3 mana 2-2 two -two that taps to add double colorless to our mana pool. So we've seen very similar cards to the Mirror, this is also a reprint, and uh, is very similar to the Engineer from uh, Ravnica Legions, which was also pretty decent. Now this doesn't make colored mana, so it's definitely possible that uh, you're not able to ramp into the thing you want because you don't have the necessary colors to do so, but uh, especially in green decks that tend to ramp into big creatures and blue decks that tend to play expensive card draw spells, the mirror is going to do a lot of work, so those are probably the color combinations where it's going to do the most amount of work. If you're lucky enough to get an Ugin, then this is a great way to ramp into it. So overall I'm a fan of the mirror, and I would probably give it a, a B, maybe B-. minus. Next up we have Prismite, another reprint, 2 mana for a 2-1 Golem, that for 2 mana can add 1 mana of any color to our mana pool. So it's not an efficient rate, and uh, a 2 mana 2-1 is also not particularly exciting, but every now and then you don't have any 2 drops, and uh, you'll play this or you just need a few additional ways to fix your mana, and uh, Prismite's maybe not the best way to do it, but it's still a way to potentially do it. So at the end of the day, probably just give this a D, not an exciting card, probably gonna be excluded from your deck more often than not, but every now and then it's gonna sneak its way into your deck. Next up we have Short Sword, also a reprint, and uh, yeah, Short Sword's a fine card, one mana for an equipment, and only equips for a single mana to give the equipped creature plus one plus one. So it's not particularly impactful, but it's also very cheap to play and equip, and whenever we're evaluating equipment, the equip cost is very important to look at, because equip one means we can potentially move this around multiple times in the same turn, we can attack with one creature and then move it to a different creature on defense, so the creature on defense is slightly larger, so making it uh, cheap to move around short sword potentially makes it a lot more versatile. So in a creature heavy deck that wants to be attacking, and uh, that generally has a relatively low curve and just wants to maybe boost up some of its smaller creatures a little bit with a short sword, then uh, this will do. So definitely not a very high pick, you can probably get these pretty late, but uh, short sword gets a C from me. 
Although you do have to watch out because there's one removal spell in the set in red at 5 mana that uh, punishes you for playing equipment. So if you expect to see that from your opponent and you're playing sideboarded games, you can easily consider sideboarding this out. Next up we have Silent Dart as another reprint. 1 mana artifact, and then for 4 mana we can tap and sacrifice it to deal 3 damage to any target, or any creature I should say. So, not a particularly efficient removal spell, but uh, every now and then I could see including this if for shorter removal can potentially take out a flying creature where 3 damage is usually enough to take him out. So, again, not a card you're going to play very often, but every now and then it could sneak its way into your deck, so that's probably the definition of a D. Sky Scanner, another reprint, but this is a card I like quite a bit. 3 mana for a 1-1 Thopter with flying, and when it enters the battlefield it draws a card. So, a nice uh, way to spend 3 mana, put a small evasive creature into play, couple synergies for having flying creatures, so if you happen to have the blue-white uh, tutu, it's only going to cost us 2 mana to play Sky Scanner, which is quite a bargain. And uh, yeah, I mean, evasive creatures tend to get in quite a few points of damage over time. I'll give the Sky Scanner C+, solid little card, even if there's not a ton of artifact synergy in the set like there was the last time we saw the Sky Scanner in Corset 2019. And this is a nice uh, reprint as well, Solemn Simulacrum, 4 mana for a 2-2 Golem at uh, rare, and when the Simulacrum enters the battlefield we may search our library for a basic land card and put it on the battlefield tapped, and then when the Simulacrum dies we may draw a card. So this card has value written all over it, a value when it enters the battlefield and when it dies it helps us ramp and fix our mana, so it does a lot of powerful things and uh, all for just 4 mana of any color, so it goes into any deck, perfect first pick. I'm a big fan of the Simulacrum, hopefully it'll see a bit of playing constructed. Hopefully Power Creep isn't that far yet where Simulacrum is not going to see any play. So I'll give Simulacrum a B+, just a very solid card that can slot into any deck pretty much. And next up we have Spark Hunter Masticore. A 3 mana, 3-4 three, Massacore at rare, and like most Massacores, as an additional cost to cast it, we have to discard a card. So that definitely hurts, but what do we get? We get a 3-4 with protection from Planeswalkers. That line of text is not super relevant and limited. And then for 1 mana, the Massacore deals 1 damage to target Planeswalker. Once again, not super relevant for limited. And then for 3 mana, the Master Core gains indestructible until end of turn. Now that line of text is definitely pretty relevant. Threat of activation to become indestructible, so that's both relevant on offense and defense. And the 3-4 is a relatively large creature, so it's not easy to ignore, both on offense and defense. Now of course we do have to discard a card as an additional cost, and the turn we play the Master Core, we might not have the 3 mana to protect it and make it indestructible. So it's definitely a card with a bit of risk involved, but the payoff is potentially a very nice uh, creature to play offense and defense. So I don't mind the Masticore. Might be a card that has some constructed applications, but for limited, I would still give it at least a B. Just a solid card with potentially a lot of upsides, can potentially put some auras on it to make it even better and then have it be indestructible so it's safe from any potential removal that doesn't exile or bounce it. Next up we have Tormod Script, another reprint, one that's been printed many times but uh, mostly meant as a sideboard card for Constructed, a zero mana artifact that we can tap and sacrifice to exile all cards from target player's graveyard. So I don't expect to see Tormod Script in Limited anytime soon. So this is probably one of the few F-level cards from the set, but a definitely nice addition for Constructed. So our first land is a rare Animal Sanctuary, taps for colorless mana, and for 2 mana we can tap the Sanctuary and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target bird, cat, dog, goat, ox or snake. So I've uh, already looked at all the cards in the set to see how many birds, cats, dogs, goats, oxen, and uh, snakes there were, and the result is there's quite a few dogs, since of course dogs are now 
officially a creature type in a sense, so that's not too surprising. There's a couple cats, fewer cats than dogs. There's uh, not a lot of goats, I don't think there's any goats. There's uh, no oxen I could find, and there's, I think, two snakes. One was the quaddle in blue-green, and then there's a snake in black as well. And then most of the cats and dogs were in the Naya colors, so green, white, and red. And uh, probably not gonna do a whole lot outside of it. And then birds, there's also a couple birds in uh, white and uh, maybe in blue as well, I'm not sure. Yeah, so especially in the Naya colors where you've got a bit of overlap with birds, cats, and dogs, uh, the sanctuary is gonna be at its best. So it is a bit of a build around, I don't expect to take this early. But if you already have a couple cats and dogs and you get past the Sanctuary, maybe you have that uh, red, white and common that searches up two dogs, then the Sanctuary becomes a more appealing option. So the payoff is definitely there, putting plus one plus one counters on your creatures does start adding up. But hopefully you have at least two of the corresponding creature types in play. Because if you're only putting one counter on a creature, it's not too exciting, but as soon as you're starting to put uh, two or more in play, it's quite good. So at the end of the day, I would probably give Sanctuary a B. Just uh, a nice build around and an incentive to maybe go out of your way to include some additional creature types. Then I'll uh, do a rating for all of these gain lands at once. So these are all reprints and we've seen them multiple times now. So they come into play tapped, produce one man of both colors and then uh, gain one life when they enter the battlefield, so a nice bit of mana fixing. Typically, if you're playing a two-color deck, you're happy to have the first two copies of any of these tapped lands that gain one life. So a nice uh, improvement to your mana base. And I would rate them around a C+, so I would take them over replaceable C-level commons, but uh, I would not necessarily take them over the premium cards C+, for all the gain lands including Blossoming Sands, Backwater. Now we have a rare with Fabled Passage, another reprint. A nice improvement over Evolving Wilds and Thermorphic Expanse. So it can fetch up any basic land and it comes into play untapped if we had uh, four or more lands in play. Yeah, another nice bit of mana fixing, probably give it a C plus as well. Don't get to gain the life, but potentially don't have the drawback of the land coming into play tapped and can also help out in a three or four color deck where a dual lands might not be enough. Then we've got some more of the gain lands. Radiant Fountain, also another nice reprint. So colorless land that enters untapped and gains two life when it enters a battlefield. So two life is definitely a relevant amount, but uh, the land doesn't make any colored mana. So most limited decks can't really afford to play a ton of colorless lands, because the mana bases in limited are already pretty rough. If you're playing a 9-8 mana base, it's usually just barely good enough. So once you start adding colorless lands to that mix, it's just going to make the deck even more inconsistent. But if you can complement Radiant Fountain with a few dual lands, then things are a lot more reasonable. Or if your uh, mana costs in the deck are not that demanding, Fountain becomes a lot more appealing. So overall, I wouldn't stake the fountain particularly highly, but one side note is the black-white life gain synergies, where there are a few cards that care about you gaining three life in one turn. So if you can combine one life gains from, for instance, the black-white uncommon that we saw earlier with the two life from Radiant Fountain, all of a sudden you're gaining three life and potentially enabling some powerful synergies. So outside of the black-white life gain deck, I probably wouldn't look at Fountain too much. But in the black-white life gain deck, then uh, you could potentially prioritize Radiant Fountain, and I would give it around a C. But uh, yeah, definitely an interesting card that will have you evaluating your mana bases more often. We've got the Highlands as another gain lands, Squire Barrens, Swiftwater Cliffs, and then we have a reprint of the Temples. So we've got uh, five of the ten temples returning in Core Set 2021. Enter Battlefield tapped and lets us scry one. So typically scry one's going to be better than gaining one life. 
So these are better than the gain lands, but of course you're happy with both of them and you don't always get the choice of uh, which one you get. So just a, a nice addition to any mana base. Sometimes you'll even play these even if you don't need both colors, just as a land that comes into play tapped that lets you scry one as long as you have one of the two colors in your deck. So definitely don't be afraid of including these if uh, you don't have both colors. Most limited decks are not going to play stuff on turn one, so playing this tapped and getting the scry one value can be worth it. And later in the game you can probably find a spot to play this tapped and get a bit of scry value. I would give the uh, temples a total rating of C plus as well. Probably a little bit better than the gain lands, but probably not by a wide enough margin to get a completely different grade. But uh, happy to have these in any limited deck. So there's all the temples. And then we've got some more gain lands. And then we get to the basics. All right, so those are all the lands. And then I'll take a quick look at Ugin, the Spirit Dragon. Eight mana for a colorless Planeswalker. So this is not an artifact, this is colorless, so slightly different. Seven loyalty, the plus two deals three damage to any target. The minus X exiles each permanent with converted mana cost X or less. That's one or more colors, so won't be able to get rid of artifacts but uh, gets rid of pretty much anything else. And then the minus 10 gains 7 life, draws 7 cards, and then puts up to 7 permanent cards from your hand onto the battlefield. So yeah, Ugin's uh, pretty busted. There's no sweepers in the set outside of Ugin. There's one that's uncommon in black, giving everything minus 2, minus 2, but that's about it. So Ugin is the only sweeper you really need to be worried about. And it's a sweeper that you usually can't do much about anyway, because uh, there's no way to save your team from an exile-based effect like this. Even giving your team indestructible is not going to save them. If you can get to 8 mana and cast Ugin and resolve Ugin, you are typically going to win the game. I can't think of too many exceptions. So that's probably the definition of an S, a card that, if you can resolve it, will win you the game single-handedly can first wipe the board with a minus X, and then we can start winning the game with the plus two ability, killing stuff and going face, and maybe get the ultimate off as well. So definitely a very exciting card if you can uh, pick it up in limited. So our first white card is Alpine Watchdog. So this is a card that was mentioned in the red-white multicolor Alpine Houndmaster. So the Alpine Houndmaster can search up Alpine Watchdog, a 2-mana, two 2-2, two, two, Vigilance Creature, and of course a dog. Dogs have a bit of synergy in the set, a few cards that uh, work well with dogs. We saw the land earlier, the Animal Sanctuary putting counters on dogs. That's one of them, and uh, there's a couple more. So we have to factor that in as well, and of course the main synergy with the Watchdog is going to be with the Houndmaster. So 2-2. Two, two, Vigilance for two, nothing super exciting, but put together all those additional tiny synergies and you've got yourself a playable card. So probably give the Alpine Watchdog a C. And then something special for this uh, Corsa 2021 review. We'll give all the dogs a special good boy rating and the Alpine Watchdog gets a 12 out of 10 for me. Next up we have Angelic Ascension, two mana instant that says exile target creature or planeswalker its controller creates a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying so pretty interesting card you'll probably be pointing this at your own creature more often than not turning something small into a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying which you know is definitely a significant threat a 4-4 flyer would typically cost you at least four mana if not more so getting it for two mana is quite a bargain, and you even get it at instant speed. So probably what you want to be trying to accomplish with the Ascension is have your opponent attack, and then for two mana, turn one of your small creatures, maybe even a tapped one, into a 4-4 blocker that can ambush one of the opponent's attackers, and then you're left with a 4-4 creature that can start attacking and blocking. 
So the upside on Ascension is potentially quite high, but there is a bit of setup cost. You do need a creature to exile in the first place. There's not too many tokens in the set that you can uh, exile with the Ascension. Every now and then, if you're facing a huge bomb, you could use the Ascension on the opponent's creature as well, maybe especially in a blue-white deck where you also have a bounce spell to then bounce the opponent's angel token and get rid of it permanently. But uh, for the most part, you're going to be pointing this at your own creature. So all that uh, together probably makes for a nice C+, plus at the very least. But I could easily see this overperforming and ending more towards the B category. But uh, definitely a very interesting card with a, a lot of neat applications that I look forward to uh, playing with. Next up we have the Anointed Chorister, a 1-mana one 1-1 one one Human Cleric at common with a lifelink. And for 4 and a white, the Chorister gets plus 3 plus 3 until end of turn. So a 1-mana one 1-1 mana, one one lifelink, nothing exciting. But a 1 mana 1 1 lifelink with a threat of activation to potentially become a 4 4 definitely has my attention. This is the type of card that typically doesn't look great but plays out a lot better than it uh, reads on paper. So I'm probably going to give this a higher rating than most people would. And I'm going to land on a C. It's just that these mana sync creatures with threat of activation always tend to overperform Brushwag from Ikoria, a nice example, although that did have some additional synergies with uh, the mutate mechanic as well, which we don't have here. But we do have some life gain synergies in the set, so that uh, potentially works nicely with the Chorister as well. Next up we have Avon Gagglemaster, a 5 mana 4-3 Bird Warrior at Uncommon. It flies, and when it enters a battlefield, you gain 2 life for each creature you control with flying. So 5 mana for 3 flyer, not bad, and we gain life as soon as we play it. So this reminds me of the angel from uh, M19 that gained 2 life whenever you attacked with it. That was also 5 mana for 3. This gains life right away, so you don't have to attack with it first. Pretty solid card, and uh, at the very least a B, potentially even a B plus. And in the flyer stack where you can potentially play this at a discounted rate, it's going to be even better, but I expect this to be quite sold in any white deck. Bane Slayer Angel, 5 mana for a 5 5 Mythic Rare Angel with Flying First Strike Lifelink and Protection from Demons and Dragons. Now, you would be surprised at how often Protections from Demons and uh, Dragons comes up. It's not often, but uh, probably more often than you would expect. There's a few Dragons and Demons in the set where this could be relevant, where the opponent can block the angel, not even chum block. So, Baneslayer Angel basically reads if the opponent can't answer the angel, they're gonna lose. But uh, it is still a creature without an enter the battlefield ability, so the opponent does get the opportunity to untap and kill the Baneslayer Angel, and uh, that's pretty much end of story. But if they don't answer the angel right away, they're gonna lose very quickly and it's pretty much impossible to outrace Baneslayer Angel. This is, at the very least, an A. Not sure if I quite want to go all the way to an S, but uh, it's definitely a A plus territory at the very least, and it probably doesn't matter if we give this an S or an A, since you're just going to first pick this out of every pack you open, pretty much. So, yeah, very strong card, and uh, puts the opponent to the test. Do they have removal, yes or no? And it does have to be some pretty specific removal. Some removal spells are not going to be quite good enough to deal with the Baneslayer Angel by themselves. So definitely a uh, powerhouse in Limited and hopefully still good enough to see a bit of play in Constructed. Hopefully it's not too far gone. Next up we have a new Planeswalker, Basri Cat. One and double white for a legendary Basri Planeswalker that starts out at 3 loyalty. And the plus one ability puts a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature, and it gains indestructible until end of turn. Next up we had the minus two ability. Whenever one or more non-token creatures attack this turn, create that many one one white soldier creature tokens that are tapped and attacking. The tokens don't gain indestructible necessarily, so 
The opponent does have the opportunity to just block them with a larger creature and kill them. So the minus two doesn't strike me like a particularly effective ability. You're probably going to be more interested in using the plus one ability over and over again. And then we have the minus six ultimate. If we plus three times and then minus six, we get an emblem with at the beginning of combat on our turn, create a one one white soldier creature token and then put a plus one plus one counter on each creature control. So if we can get to the ultimate, it's definitely going to take over the game. If we're on the play and we go maybe one drop, two drop into a bossery, the opponent's going to be under a ton of pressure and they're going to have a hard time removing our planeswalker. But any time where we're not curving out perfectly, maybe we draw a bossery a little bit later, maybe we're on the draw and we're behind on board, then uh, bossery is not going to be too impressive. It's going to maybe put a plus one counter on a creature, maybe even a second counter before Basri eventually dies. I don't think I'm quite willing to give Basri an A rating, just because it's still somewhat limited to being good in uh, low curve aggressive decks. But uh, in those low curve aggressive decks, it's definitely going to be a very menacing card. So I think I'm just going to give it a B, uh, maybe even a B plus. But uh, yeah, just don't expect Basri to overperform in a more mid rangey white deck where you don't necessarily play a lot of cheap creatures, because this card does want to be in a low curve aggressive deck. And next up we have Basri's Acolyte, 4 mana for a 2-3 Cat Cleric at common. So a cat is relevant for the Animal Sanctuary that we saw earlier. It has lifelink, all right, and when the Acolyte enters a battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two other target creatures you control. Wow, that's a lot of text for a 4 mana common. So we get a 2-3 lifelink and we get two plus one plus one counters potentially. So yeah, this card seems incredibly good. Again, you do want to be somewhat curving out to make sure you get full value from those two plus one plus one counters. But uh, the plus one plus one counters also synergize in the green-white archetype. If we have the dream curve of a turn two Conclave Mentor into a turn four Basri's Acolyte, those two plus one plus one counters all of a sudden turn into four plus one plus one counters. So that definitely gets out of hand. So this is definitely going to be at its best in a green-white deck. So overall, Acolyte's probably at the very least a B, and it's uh, probably going to be the best common in white, looking at the entire list here. So very strong card. And next up we have Basri's Lieutenant, or Lieutenant if you want a British pronunciation. Four mana for a 3-4 Human Knight with Vigilance and Protection from Multicolored. And when the Lieutenant enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So you can target the Lieutenant itself with the ability if you don't have any other targets. And when the Lieutenant or another creature you control dies, if it had a plus one plus one counter on it, create a 2-2 White Knight creature token with Vigilance. So that's a lot of text to parse. Now the protection from multicolored is definitely going to be relevant and limited, but it's also definitely a, an ability that's maybe going to see more uh, applications in Constructed, where it doesn't get bounced by the Fairy Time Raveler, for instance. If we just put the plus one plus one counter from the Lieutenant on itself, it's going to be a 4-5 for four, 4 mana in white. That's also unprecedented, getting so many stats for a white creature. And we also get Vigilance on top. And then when the Lieutenant dies, we even are left with a 2-2 two -two Knight token. And we have the option of spreading out that plus one counter and putting it somewhere else. And then there's also those plus one counter synergies in green white potentially. So Lieutenant has a lot going for it. And I think it's probably going to be a better rare more often than not than uh, the Planeswalker himself. So I'm willing to give Lieutenant at the very least a B plus, if not an A minus. Just a very efficient card with a lot of useful abilities and definitely has some constructed applications with protection from relevant cards, as well as giving you a bit of insurance against sweeper effects, leaving behind some 2-2 knight tokens. So a very powerful card for sure. And next up we have Basri's Solidarity, two mana sorcery at uncommon, that puts a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. 
So this card definitely wants to go in a go wide deck, probably somewhere between a C and a C plus in a deck that has those uh, synergies, like I mentioned, the Conclave Mentor, then uh, it's probably going to be closer to a C plus. In a deck that doesn't have those synergies, it's probably going to be closer to a C, but definitely a solid card, even though it's just a sorcery, so it's not going to be a combo trick that's going to blow out the opponents, but still pretty solid. Next up we have the Celestial Enforcer, 2 and a white for a 2-3, common human cleric, and for 1 and a white we can tap it to tap target creature, but we can only activate this ability if we control a creature with flying. So that is a pretty big if, not every deck is going to have a ton of flyers. And if we don't, we're left with a 2-3 for 3 mana, which is nothing special. So... Yeah, the Enforcer's fine if you've got a blue-white Flyers archetype. Outside of it, it's not that exciting, so probably give it a C. We've got Concordia Pegasus once again. One on a white for a 1-3 Pegasus with flying. Potentially fits in the flying deck and uh, potentially can hold off small Flyers from the opponent as well. Nothing special, but definitely a card you wouldn't mind playing on 2 mana if you're lacking other 2 drops. So I'd probably give this a C. Next up we have Containment Priest, a pretty exciting reprint for Constructed potentially. Maybe less so for Limited, as we get a 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Human Cleric at rare with Flash, and if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast, exile it instead. So this prevents reanimation shenanigans, it prevents effects uh, putting creatures from your hand onto the battlefield. Potentially could have stopped Winota putting Agent of Treachery in play. For limited, we're looking mostly just at a 2 mana 2-2 two -two with flash, which is nothing special, probably just a C. Next up we have a Daybreak Charger, 1 and white for a 3-1 Unicorn at common. And when a charger enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So probably at its best alongside a small evasive creature that can get that uh, 2 damage translated on the opponent's face. But yeah, still potentially allows for a smaller creature to attack and make a profitable attack for a turn. And then we're left with a 3-1 which, you know, does hit pretty hard. So if the opponent doesn't have a great blocker for it, it can definitely do some work. So it's a fine card, but it's nothing spectacular, so it probably falls in the C category. Next up we have Defiant Strike, another reprint. One mana instant, giving target creature plus one plus so until end of turn, and you get to draw a card, so it replaces itself, and you get a nice little effect giving a creature plus one plus so. Not the most impactful ability, and uh, definitely a card you should be keenly aware of, when going in combat, if the opponent represents it, so you don't get blown out by it. But uh, yeah, you know, the value of Defiant Strike can fluctuate, but the opportunity cost is pretty low. So it's a card you're probably happy to include in most white aggressive decks with a low curve and lots of creatures. So I'll give this a C. Next up we have Dub, reprinted once again. 3 mana for an aura that enchants a creature, and the enchanted creature gets plus 2 plus 2 and has first strike, and also is a knight in addition to its other types. Turning into a knight doesn't have any particular synergies in the set, but plus 2 plus 2 and first strike are definitely some relevant stats. And I'm usually someone that doesn't like these types of auras, since they tend to go all in and get punished by removal but we are getting to the day and age where removal spells are pretty inefficient in limited. They tend to cost quite a bit of mana and you don't necessarily get a ton of them. So these types of enchantments are getting better and better as removal gets worse. So Dub is definitely a playable card, a card that's going to put your opponent to the test if you play it. If they can remove your creature, you're probably going to get two for ones, but if they can't remove it, then that creature can easily run away with the game. So ideally you can pair this with a creature that's somehow protected. We saw the uh, Master Core with Indestructible earlier, and there's a couple Hexproof creatures in the set as well. So I'll give Dub a C, still prone to getting 2 for 1, but if uh, the opponent doesn't have an answer right away, 
could potentially deal quite a bit of damage. Another nice reprint here with Faith's Feathers. 4 mana for an enchantment aura that enchants a permanence. And when the Feathers enters the battlefield, we gain 4 life. And the enchanted permanence can't attack or block, and its activated abilities can be activated unless they're mana abilities. So this can potentially enchant a Planeswalker as well, and prevent it from being uh, activated. And other various permanents that might have activated abilities. So it's a pretty versatile card. Overall, pretty solid removal spell. I would give this a B. And uh, do keep in mind that there are a few disenchants that are even main deckable in the set that could punish Fate's Feathers. There's a few cards that can give protection, and then the Fate's Feathers could fall off, so that's potentially a drawback. And uh, we also saw that blue-white rare that can bounce a creature back, that can also potentially free it from a Fate's Feathers. But generally speaking, most decks are not going to be able to punish it too much. Maybe the Sacrifice deck can also get a bit of value from the enchanted creature by sacrificing it, so just something to keep in mind when playing enchantment-based removal. It's usually not as clean as just uh, killing something or exiling something, but still a very versatile removal spell that you're going to be very happy to have in any white tech. And next up we have Falconer Adapts. 3 and a white for a 2-3 human soldier at uncommon, and when the Falconer attacks, Create a 1-1 white bird creature token with flying that's tapped and attacking. So a 4 mana 2-3 is pretty bad, but this is more of a build around card. So if you have ways of getting the falconer through for damage and keep it attacking consistently, you can very quickly make an army of bird tokens that's pretty hard to deal with. The falconer definitely needs a bit of help, but if you can get the falconer a bit of help, be it an equipment, an enchantment, to enhance it. We saw Dub earlier in white. There's an enchantment in blue to give a creature flying. There's more ways to give creatures flying in blue as well that could synergize with the Falconer. Those are all valid ways of uh, synergizing with it. So all things considered, I would probably give this a C+. Plus. But uh, again, keep in mind that you do need to build around it a little bit to get maximum value. Next up we have Feet of Resistance, a reprint from Cans of Tarkir. One and white for an instant, putting a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control, and it gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. If you want a shortcut to remember what uh, protection entails, it's that, D-E-B-T. So the D stands for it can be damaged by sources of the chosen color, E means it can be equipped or enchanted by sources of the chosen color. B means it can be blocked by sources of the chosen color. And T means it can be targeted by sources of the chosen color. You give a creature protection that's already enchanted by some sort of removal spell, it can potentially fall off. So if you give a creature protection from white, if it had a Fate's Feathers attached, now the Fate's Feathers will fall off because it can be enchanting a creature with protection from white, and there's a couple other enchantment-based removal spells in the set that uh, apply similarly. And then of course you can use this mid-combat to save a creature from lethal damage, or you can save a creature from a targeted removal spell by fizzling it, by giving the uh, same color protection. So Feet of Resistance is a pretty versatile card, and potentially can be used retroactively, as I mentioned, with enchantment-based removal. So it's a pretty solid card, and uh, one that I'm pretty happy to have if I'm looking for combat tricks in white. At the end of the day, it's still a combat trick, so I can give it too high of a rating, but it's probably somewhere between a C and a C+. Next up we have a Gale Swooper, 3 and a white for a 3-2 Griffin at common, with flying and when Gale Swooper enters the battlefield, target creature gains flying until end of turn. So just a nice little flyer that can maybe get an additional creature in for some evasive damage. And we mentioned earlier the Falconer could synergize quite nicely with Gale Swooper. That's worthy of a C plus rating. And next up we've got another pretty exciting reprint with Glorious Anthem. That's why we keep referring to these plus one plus one effects as Anthem effects. This is the one and only Glorious Anthem. 
1 and double white for an enchantment, giving creatures we control plus 1 plus 1. So this will uh, apply to any creatures in play, but also any future creatures, so it's a bit more impactful than a plus 1 plus 1 counters under most circumstances. Although I guess in the set it misses out on some of those plus 1 counter synergies. But still, pretty powerful card. And uh, it's an enchantment, so pretty difficult for most decks to remove, so it's gonna stick around for a while. So as long as you're a creature-heavy deck, you should get pretty good results out of the Glorious Anthem. So I'll give it a B. And next up we have a Griffin Airy. One and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon, saying at the beginning of your end step, if you gained three or more life this turn, create a 2-2 white Griffin creature token with flying. So this is definitely one of the more interesting cards to evaluate, because it's such a build-around card. So only the most dedicated life gain decks are gonna want this, but we've seen a few incidental life gain cards, like the uh, Avon Gaggle Master, which can potentially gain up to four life if we've got an additional flyer in play. We have the uh, reprint of Revitalize at common and white, which we'll get to in a second too. So that's another easy way to meet the requirement. So it's a tricky card to evaluate since not every deck is going to be interested. But overall, I'll give Ari a C, but I'll reserve the right to potentially make it a C plus or potentially even higher later, just because it's a card that can fluctuate quite heavily based on how often you can get all the enablers for it. Next up we have Idol of Endurance, a rare artifact for two and a white. And when Idol of Endurance enters a battlefield, exile all creature cards with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard until the idol leaves the battlefield. And then for one and a white we can tap the idol and until end of turn we can cast a creature spell from among the cards exiled with idol without paying its mana cost. Only gonna get back small creatures, although in whites usually we have lots of uh, cheap creatures that will meet the requirements. Potentially a nice way of getting a bit of card advantage, although it is somewhat uh, restrictive in its nature. So I'm not huge on Idol of Endurance, but it's definitely a card with potential. So I'll be conservative and just give it a C, but I'm willing to be surprised and it could end up being quite a bit better, especially in more low curve aggressive decks. And next up we have Legion's Judgment, another reprint from Ixalan. Two and a white for a sorcery, destroying target creature with power four or greater at common. So this was usually a card you wouldn't mind having a, a copy of in your deck, Although in Ixalan, there were a few decks that uh, had some very large creatures, namely the dinosaur decks, which we don't necessarily have in Corset 2021. Although green typically has some pretty large creatures. So it's usually a card you don't mind having one copy of in the main deck, and then it can potentially get better after sideboard if you see that the opponent has lots of large creatures, especially in green. I'll probably give this a C, but definitely a card that can uh, improve after sideboard. A Light of Promise is an aura for two and a white at Uncommon. Enchants a creature and the enchanted creature has whenever you gain life put that many plus one plus one counters on this creature. Yeah, not a huge fan of uh, Light of Promise. We do have a few small life gain sub themes but the payoff isn't huge here and we're taking quite a bit of risk by playing an aura that doesn't necessarily have an immediate impact. It's not completely unplayable. I'm sure we'll see a deck where this could be quite good, but I'll still be pretty conservative and just give it a D. Next up we have Makeshift Battalion, a reprint from War of the Spark, two and a white for a human soldier, and when the Makeshift Battalion and at least two other creatures attack, put a plus one plus one counter on Makeshift Battalion, and it's a 3-2, so wants to go in aggressive decks with lots of small creatures typically and it's a fine card in those decks, nothing special so just a C for makeshift battalion. Next up we have a Mangara, the Diplomat, three and a white for a mythic rare, a legendary human cleric 
It's a 2-4 with lifelink, saying whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or planeswalkers you control, draw a card. And whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. So this is a pretty annoying card to play against. It's gonna severely discourage the opponent from attacking with two or more creatures or casting two or more spells in the same turn. So that probably means it's a pretty good card. And then just looking at the stats, a 2-4 lifelink for 4 mana is respectable at the very least. Mangara seems quite good, I think I'm willing to give this an A. And next up we have a 9 lives, 1 and double white for an enchantment at rare. It has hexproof and it says if a source would deal damage to you, prevent that damage and put an incarnation counter on 9 lives. And when there are 9 or more incarnation counters on 9 lives, exile it. And when it leaves the battlefield, you lose the game. So you could kind of look at 9 lives as a very powerful life gain spell in that it can uh, buy you a lot of time potentially. It looks at each individual source as one individual counter. So if the opponent attacks you with a swarm of tokens, they can potentially put multiple incarnation counters on this enchantment at once. So that's pretty bad. And at the end of the day, you're not really adding any creatures to the board. So you're not really progressing your board all that much with this. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan. I could see like a very weird control deck where this can buy you just enough time to be worth it. Maybe you've got a lot of card draw to make up for it. And it does kind of line up nicely if the opponent has like one very big creature that could deal a ton of damage and now all of a sudden it's only adding one incarnation counter instead of uh, dealing a big chunk of damage. So there are situations that you can imagine where this could be somewhat useful. But generally speaking, I don't think you should take this highly. And you should probably not include this in your deck more often than not. So I'll give it a D, not quite an F, but I wouldn't recommend running this. Next up we have Pack Leader, one and white for a dog. It's a 2-2 and it gives other dogs we control plus one plus one. And when pack leader attacks, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn to dogs you control, including the pack leader itself. So a nice little payoff for playing dogs. And uh, yeah, 2 mana 2-2 two, two with quite a bit of upside. So there's a lot to like about the pack leader. Nice incentive to draft a couple dogs. Works nicely in red whites, especially if you can pick up a few alpine hound masters with the corresponding dogs. So... Yeah, I'll give Pack Leader a C plus, and uh, we'll give a good boy a rating of uh, 13 out of 10. Next up we have Rambunctious Mutt, 3 and double white for a 3-4 dog, and when the Mutt enters the battlefield, destroy target artifact or enchantment an opponent controls. So this is very reminiscent of the Indric Stomp Howler, the 4-4 that destroyed an artifact or enchantment when it enters the battlefield which was a pretty good card, even saw quite a bit of play in cube drafts for a while. So the mutt seems quite good. There's definitely a decent amount of artifacts and enchantments running around that you randomly get to kill. And 5 mana for a 3-4 while not impressive is definitely still a relevant stat line. So I'm a fan of the mutt. I think I'm willing to give this a C plus, And it's a card that can potentially improve in value after sideboards or can potentially get a bit worse if the opponent doesn't have any targets. So if you're playing this in best of three, feel free to board it in or board it out accordingly. But I think I'm typically going to be happy to main deck from Buxia's Smut. Yeah, I'll give it a C plus and a good boy rating of a 14 out of 10. Next up we have Revitalize, reprinted from M19. One and a white for an instance, gaining three life and draws a card. So this is the card you want in the life gain deck as a way to enable all those life gain synergies. And uh, those are typically found in black-white, so we saw a couple in white already, and in black there's a few more. Outside of the life gain synergy decks, Revitalize is still potentially a cantrip, so if you don't have any other 
two drops in the deck. I could see just playing Revitalize as a way to spend your mana, gain a bit of life and draw a card. So you don't necessarily have to play this strictly in a life gain synergy deck. You can just play this as a filler two drop if you don't have anything else going on. But for the most part, you're interested in uh, Revitalize for the life gain applications. So in the life gain deck, this is probably going to be closer to a C+. But generally speaking, I'll give this a C. Next up we have Rune Halo, a rare enchantment reprinted from Shadowmoor. And it's a pretty weird one. As Rune Halo enters a battlefield, choose a card's name, and you have protection from the chosen card name. So you can be targeted, dealt damage, enchanted by anything with that name. So for the most part, this is going to be naming creatures. And then you have protection from the chosen creature, so that creature can deal damage to you. So it's a very weird removal spell. And uh, it's not a very good one, because the problem here is, let's say your opponent has, let's name a very powerful creature, Baneslayer Angel, in play. You play Rune Halo, you name Baneslayer Angel. All right, good. Baneslayer Angel can't deal damage to you anymore, but the opponent can still block with it. So now what? How are you going to kill the opponent if they have a 5-5 lifelink first strike flyer on defense? You probably still need to kill it at some point. So now Rune Taylor was just a way to buy yourself more time to find another removal spell at some point. In a pinch, it can maybe save you for a while. Maybe the opponent only has like one specific win condition that Rune Taylor can shut down. Or maybe they have multiple of the same card that this can shut down. And I could see this being somewhat useful. Maybe it has more applications and constructed against specific strategies. But for the most part, I wouldn't take this very highly and probably doesn't make most of my decks. So I'll give this a D. But uh, yeah, definitely an interesting card for constructed. Next up we have Sanctum of Tranquil Light. So this is the first of the Sanctums. So a legendary enchantment shrine. So we can only have one of these in play at the same time. And then for 5 and white, tap target creature, and it costs one less to activate for each shrine we control. So of course, Sanctum counts itself, so it's going to cost 5 mana to tap a creature down, which is still way too much. This is not a card you play just for this ability, this is a card you maybe play in the dedicated Sanctum build around deck, which hopefully will end up being a thing, but I don't have my hopes up, but uh, yeah, I don't recommend taking this highly. Just uh, a card that's gonna float to the one Sanctum Drafter at the table, maybe. So I'll give this a D. Next up we have Seasoned Hallow Blade, one and white for an uncommon human warrior. It's a 3-1, and it's reminiscent of Adanto Vanguard. Although instead of paying for life, we have to discard a card and then tap the Hallow Blade and it gains indestructible until end of turn. Of course, discarding a card, pretty hefty costs, especially compared to paying for life, which you typically don't mind in an aggressive deck. But the upside here is that we do get a 3-1 on both offense and defense, so it can be a pretty annoying blocker to get past. So the Hellblade's still pretty decent, definitely worse than Adanto Vanguard. Yeah, I think I like C plus for the Hallow Blade. Just a, a nice card in an aggressive deck. Potentially a nice target for any additional enchantments, as you can protect it with Indestructible. Although, keep in mind it can still potentially be exiled or bounced by blue bounce spells. So, Indestructible doesn't mean invulnerable. Then we have Secure the Scene, a 5 mana sorcery. Exiling targets a non-land permanent and its controller creates a 1-1 white soldier creature token. So pretty expensive and uh, inefficient, clunky removal, but it is removal nonetheless. And we don't get a lot of it in white, apparently. We saw face feathers and now we see secure the scene and there's not much else in between. So yeah, secure the scene, not a card you're happy to play multiples of, but as a one-off or a two-off in a deck just to have a bit of removal, for those busted rares that the opponent might have could be fine. This can exile any non-land permanents, including Planeswalkers, for instance. So, you know, it's nice to have a few reset buttons 
even if the opponent does get a 1-1 token afterwards. So probably give this a C+. Selfless Savior is a 1-mana, one 1-1 one one dog at Uncommon, and we can sacrifice Selfless Savior at any point, and another target creature we control gains indestructible until end of turn. Quite a bit better than the Bodyguard with its ability, since we can play this on turn 1 and still save a creature later, so we don't have to play this with uh, a specific target already in play. A nice one drop to run out there on turn 1, maybe chips in for 1 or 2 points of damage, and then we'll keep it around, providing an extra body to maybe pick up a plus 1 counter or help out with some other creature-based synergy, and then can be sacrificed to save your more valuable creature. So, it does seem like a pretty innocuous little card, but I think it's going to play out better than it looks at first sight. So I'll give the Selfless Savior a C+, and a good boy rating of 15 out of 10. And next up we have Siege Striker, 2 and a white for a human soldier at Uncommon. It's a 1-1 one -one with double strike, but whenever the Siege Striker attacks, we may tap any number of untapped creatures we control, and then Siege Striker gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn for each creature tapped this way. Now I mentioned there's not too many token makers in white this time around, so we're not expecting to tap a whole lot of creatures. But, uh, you know, if you curve out 1-drop, 2-drop into a Siege Striker, turn 4 maybe play another creature before attacking, this could potentially attack as a 4-4 double strike, so it doesn't mess around. And uh, yeah, I mean, double strike is pretty tricky to block for the opponent, and uh, will require an answer. So, Siege Striker seems quite good to me, and uh, I'm willing to give this a B. This is a card that synergizes very well with our uh, previous card, the Selfless Savior, since we can play the 1-1 one -one dog, and uh, we can tap the dog to pump up the Siege Striker, and then also sacrifice it to potentially save Striker and make it indestructible. So, those two seem to pair quite well with each other. Next up we have Speaker of the Heavens, a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one Human Cleric and Rare with Vigilance and Lifelink, and it can tap to create a 4-4 White Angel Creature token with flying, but we can only activate this if we have at least 7 life more than our starting life total, and only at sorcery speed, so we need 27 life in Limited to activate this. So I'm afraid that's probably not gonna happen very often, Maybe in a very dedicated life gain deck, but even there, the opponents basically can be doing anything proactive to reduce our life total. The best case scenario, I guess, is play this turn 1, turn 2 revitalize, turn 3 revitalize, and hope the opponent hasn't attacked us yet, and then we can make our angel token. So it seems pretty unlikely, but definitely a card that could have some constructed applications, especially in Historic with the life gain deck, with Ranger of Eos, a way to potentially search it up as well. So I'm looking forward to trying this out in my life gain decks. But for limiteds, I'll give this a D. Next up we have Staunch Shieldmate, 1 mana for a 1-3 Dwarf Soldier, and that's it. So there's not really a Toughness Matters theme in this set, so a 1 mana 1-3 one is nothing special. Could potentially help out with our uh, Siege Striker we saw earlier, that just wants to have lots of creatures to tap down. Maybe in a deck that has a bit of plus one counter synergy, where you just want to have lots of cheap bodies to then put plus one plus one counters onto, this could be playable. So in a very aggressive white deck, I could see this being playable, but uh, I don't give this a particularly high grade, so I'll just give this a D but uh, could definitely see playing those low-curve aggressive decks. And then we have a Swift Response, one and white for an instance, destroying target tapped creature. So this is quite the upgrade over a sorcery that destroyed a tapped creature. So this card is strictly meant to be used defensively, so in a white aggressive deck, Swift Response is probably not going to be very good, but in a white controlling deck, this card seems amazing. It just misses out against Vigilance creatures. So that's uh, the major drawback. So yeah, I'll give this a C+. Next up we have Tempered Veteran, 1 and a white for a 1-2 Human Knight at Uncommon. 
for one white mana we can tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature with a plus one plus one counter already on it. So pretty big restriction, but in the green-white plus one counter sub-theme deck this could be okay I guess. And then for six mana we can tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. So very expensive ability to put a single plus one counter on a creature. But then once we put the first counter on it, we can use a cheaper ability to put a counter on it next. But we also are paying two mana for a 1-2, which is not particularly exciting. So this is definitely build arounds that you're only interested in if you already have a lot of plus one counters in your deck to begin with. Because if you need to use a six mana ability first, it's not very good. But in a green-white plus one plus one counter matters deck, I could see this being quite good, especially alongside Conclave Mentor doubling the counters essentially. Without any plus one counter synergies, probably a D. With some plus one counter synergies, C. With a lot of plus one counter synergies, even a C plus. So has a pretty wide range. Valor Steed is a 5 mana 3-3 three, three unicorn with Vigilance, and when it enters the battlefield makes a 2-2 two, two white knight creature token with Vigilance. So we get 5 power and toughness worth of stats for 5 mana, all Vigilance. So yeah, fine card. Sometimes splitting up the uh, power and toughness across multiple bodies is a good thing, sometimes it's not a good thing. There's a few cards in the set that care about having multiple creatures out, especially in white. So in that sense it could be a good thing to spread things out. So overall nothing exciting but definitely a playable card. So somewhere between C and a C plus. I'll start with just a C for Valor Steed but uh, I could be proven wrong and it could be closer to a C plus. Next up we have a Vryn Wingmare reprint from Magic Origins where it used to be a rare so downgraded in rarity. So two and a white for a 2-1 Pegasus with flying, saying non-creature spells cost one generic mana more to cast. So this applies to both the opponent, but it also applies to us, making all our non-creature spells one more expensive. In a blue-white flyer stack, that's going to be mostly creatures. This is going to be pretty good and probably mostly impacts the opponent. If you have a lot of expensive non-creature spells yourself, of course it's going to be pretty bad. Typically three mana, Two power flyer is fine. It's a rate we're pretty used to paying for a flyer. I'll give Rin Wingmare a C plus with a caveat that you don't have a lot of expensive non-creature spells yourself, otherwise you probably just don't want a Vryn Wingmare to begin with. Awarded battlements, two and a white for an O3 wall with defender, saying attacking creatures we control get plus one plus O. So only affects attacking creatures so doesn't work all that well on defense. And an 3 for 3 is not a great blocker, doesn't actually hold off all that much. So yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the battlements, there's not really a go wide theme in the set, so it's not like we're attacking with a whole bunch of 1-1 tokens that all of a sudden get plus 1 plus 0, where this could be okay. Definitely a nice flavorful card, but uh, I don't rate it particularly highly, so I'll just give this a D. Baron, Tolarian Archmage, 1 and double blue for a 2-2 legendary human wizard. And when a Baron enters the battlefield, return up to one other target creature or planeswalker to Sonar's hand, and at the beginning of your end step, if a permanent was put into your hand from the battlefield, this turn draw a card. So just by itself, it's kind of a mana war that can bounce an opposing creature, but it has a bit of upside where if you bounce your own stuff, you can potentially draw a card, and it doesn't have to be with Baron's ability. If you have another way of bouncing your own creature back, you can potentially draw some extra cards, which is always nice. So yeah, Baron seems pretty good. A nice upgrade over the typical Man of War effect. So I'll give Baron a B, salt card. Next up we have Cancel, reprinted for the billionth time. Yeah, always uh, a card that you could consider playing in the main deck. It's gonna get better the more other instant speed cards you have. But typically cancel falls somewhere around a C rating. Just a fine card, but uh, 
not every blue deck is going to be interested in it. We've got Capture Sphere reprinted once again. Was recently in Ikoria, before that in Guilds of Ravnica. So pretty fine uh, removal spell for mana for an enchantment aura with flash that we can play at instant speed. Enchanting a creature, it taps the enchanted creature down and it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So as far as removal goes, it's not a bad way to deal with a creature. Now of course it doesn't get rid of any utility or uh, passive ability on the creature. So for that you'll need to turn to different removal spells. And as we mentioned a few times, there's a couple drawbacks to enchantment based removal. You can potentially disenchant it, you can sacrifice a creature for value, or you can bounce the creature or maybe give it protection so that the enchantment falls off. So keep that in mind when playing with enchantment based removal. But overall, Capture Sphere still gets a C plus from me. Then we've got Discontinuity, a 6 mana mythic, instant, and if it's in your turn, it costs 2 and a blue and less to cast, so then it just costs 1 and a blue. And it says end the turn, so lots of rules text to accompany end the turn, but it's pretty much the way it sounds. So the way you're going to use this continuity more often than not is probably just cast it in the opponent's upkeep, and then it functions as a janky time walk effect where the opponent does get an untap step, so it's definitely worse than just casting time walk more often than not. But it does have upside to where you can potentially cast it at some other point to maybe fizzle a removal spell. But uh, yeah, I'm not that into discontinuity, I don't think it's great. So I mostly just look at it as a 6 mana time walk, which is not particularly exciting. So I'll probably give this a D. Then we've got Enthralling Hold. A 5 mana enchantment aura at uncommon that enchants a creature, and you can't choose an untapped creature as the spell's target, and then you control the enchanted creature. So it's a mind control that only works on a tapped creature. So that does mean that whatever creature you're trying to steal already got an attack in. It doesn't work if you're the aggressor and you need to get rid of a blocker. It doesn't work against vigilance. And of course it can be disenchanted. So it is probably worse than it looks. Typically when thinking of mind control, those are some of the most powerful effects in magic, especially for limited. But this does have quite a few additional restrictions. That being said, it is still kind of like a mind control, which is very powerful. So probably can give this less than a B rating, but uh, yeah, probably worse than it looks at first sight. Then we've got Frantic Inventory, one and a blue for an instant, it draws a card and then draw a card equal to the number of cards named Frantic Inventory in your graveyard. So this is one of those gotta catch them all type cards that get better the more you have. So by itself, if this is the only copy in our deck, it's not very good. Paying two mana for a cantrip that just draws one card is not uh, all that great. But if we can get a few of them, it does get uh, better and better. Maybe you've got some ways to mill cards from the top of your deck and uh, put additional copies in the graveyard that way to make it better. Maybe your deck cares about drawing cards. There's a couple cards in blue-green especially that uh, synergize with drawing additional cards. There's a couple prowess cards in the set too that could synergize with inventory. So those are all cards that could make it better. What do I give inventory? Probably just a C, but it's definitely a card that will get better the more copies you have. So where the first copy might be closer to a D, the second copy closer to a C, the third copy closer to a C plus. So kind of scales the more copies you have. Then we've got Frost Breath reprinted. It's been a while since we've seen Frost Breath actually, all the way back from Magic 2014 apparently. So two and a blue for an instant, and it taps up to two target creatures, and those creatures don't untap during their controller's next untap step. So Frost Breath is deceivingly powerful, I would say. Now it's not a card that every deck wants, it's definitely more of a card for uh, aggressive tempo decks, probably at its best in like a blue-white flyers archetype or a blue-red spells matters deck, 
that wants to be somewhat aggressive. The best timing to use Frost Breath is probably in the opponent's turn just before they get a chance to attack. You can tap two creatures down so they don't get to attack you. You get to maybe attack back where the opponent doesn't get to block and then the opponent's creatures won't untap for another turn so they're potentially out of commission for two entire turn cycles. Probably just give this a C but it could go up to a C plus in a very tempo oriented aggressive deck and it's probably going to be closer to a D in a deck that's more controlling and just uh, isn't all that interested in this effect. Then we've got Ghostly Pilferer, one and a blue for a Spirit Rogue at rare. It's a 2-1 and whenever a Ghostly Pilferer becomes untapped you may pay two mana and if you do draw a card. All right, I'm in. Whenever an opponent casts a spell from anywhere other than their hand, draw a card. So that's probably not going to come up very often. Maybe was relevant once uh, companions were still around, which is no longer really the case. It's also relevant against adventures, so maybe that still has a bit of constructed applications. And then discard the cards and the ghostly pilfer can be blocked this turn. So this is reminiscent of Key to the City from uh, Kaladesh, I believe. You can potentially use the Ghostly Pilfer as a discard outlet, maybe more relevant for Constructed, maybe some sort of reanimation deck, where you can just discard whatever you want to it. Makes for a nice looting engine in the mid to late game, where you can discard lands and then use the uh, Pilfer to draw additional cards. So it's probably not an ability you're going to be using in the early game when you're setting up. So overall the Pilfer seems quite good. And uh, of course in the meantime you're also getting into damage every turn. So that also starts adding up. So I like uh, giving this a B. Then we've got Jeskai Elder reprinted from Cans of Tarkir. One on a blue for an uncommon human monk. It's a 1-2. It has prowess and whenever the Elder deals combat damage to a player we can draw a card and if we do discard a card. So 2 mana 1-2 with prowess is already pretty decent. The threat of activation with prowess is always looming and pairs quite well with those cheap instants. We'll uh, see opt in just a second as a 1 mana instant. Definitely a card that goes better in a more tempo oriented deck that wants to be curving out, beating down and backing up its creatures with cheap instants and sorceries. And then you get to deal a bit of damage with the Elder, maybe sculpt your hands and get rid of additional lands that you don't need with the ability. In a more controlling deck it's probably not going to be amazing, but overall probably still give this a C+. Then we've got Keen, Glidemaster, one and a blue for a 2-1 human soldier. And for two and a blue, target creature gains flying until end of turn. Now this is a card I like. We get a two mana two one, so it's a two drop that can trade off for opposing two drops if we're under pressure and just need to protect our life total. And then once we get to the late game where two drops typically aren't super relevant anymore, we still get a very nice ability for two and a blue to give a creature flying. So it's a great way to close out a game once we get in the later stages. So this card seems excellent, uh, C plus for me. Good early and still relevant late, that's all you can ask for from your two drops. And here's a card that potentially synergizes nicely with our uh, previous card, the Library or Larsenist, two and a blue for a 1-2 Merfolk Rogue. And when the Larsenist attacks, draw a card. So we're not getting a lot of stats for three mana, but we are potentially getting a lot of card advantage. So if we can give this flying consistently, this can provide a lot of cards. Probably don't want to spend three mana every turn giving this flying. So we'll probably look for other ways of getting the Larsenists through. But uh, spoiler alert, there are some enchantments to give Larsenists flying that we'll see in just a second. So those will combine quite well with it. So at the end of the day, without any synergy, Larsenist is not very good. But if you can give it evasion consistently, it's going to be uh, pretty useful. So I'll give this a C. Next up we have Lofty Denial, one and a blue for an instant at common. Counters target spell unless its controller pays one. And if you control a creature with flying, counter that spell unless its controller pays four instead. So four spike for two mana is not exciting. 
If we do have a creature with flying, then we get a slightly better mana leak. Closer to a convolute, I guess. Not a huge fan of Lofty Denial, but uh, in a flying dedicated deck, I guess you could consider it. But uh, you have to be pretty dedicated for it to be worth it, I think. So at the end of the day, probably just give this a D. Then we've got some miscasts, a blue mana for an instant, at uncommon to counter target instant or sorcery spell, unless its controller pays three. So pretty conditional counter spell, probably more of a sideboard card is my guess. Don't think you're going to be interested in main decking this all too often, but it is cheap, so very efficient narrow counter spells tend to see play after sideboard. But uh, as a main deck card, not particularly interested in it, so probably the definition of a D. Mistral Singer is 2 and a blue for a 2-2 Siren with Flying and Prowess. So mentioned earlier, 3 mana is typically what we expect to pay for a 2-2 Flyer these days. And we also get Prowess, so that's a nice bonus. So yeah, Mistral Singer seems pretty good. Goes well into the Blue-Red Spells archetype where we get to leverage Prowess. And goes quite well in the Blue-White Flyers archetype where we just care about having flying creatures. So it has a bit of overlap there. So overall give this a C+. Next up we have Opts, single blue mana for an instant, to scry one and draw a card. So a welcome reprint. Nice efficient cantrip, goes well with the whole blue-green draw extra card theme that we've seen and we'll see even more once we get to the green cards. And a nice cheap way to enable prowess, which is relevant in blue-red. And also just a cheap uh, spell to add to the graveyard for some of those blue-red cards. So yeah, Opt seems like a card you're gonna probably include in most blue decks. So pretty happy to have it. And there's no cheaper alternative than one mana for Opt. So I'm pretty high on Opt. Probably give this a C+. Next up we have Pursued Whale. 7 mana for a rare whale. It's an 8-8. And when Pursued Whale enters a battlefield, each opponent creates a 1-1 red pirate creature token that says this creature can block, and creatures you control attack each combat if able. And spells your opponents cast that target the whale costs 3 generic mana more to cast. So this is a, a nice Moby Dick reference, I'm guessing. Very flavorful card, and I think this card's actually quite powerful. We are paying 7 mana which is a lot, so we should expect to get quite a bit here for 7 mana, but I think we are getting a good return on our investment. So we get an 8-8, eight eight. that's pretty tricky for the opponent to remove. Having to pay 3 additional mana to get rid of it means that some of the expensive 5 mana removal spells might not be able to get rid of the whale right away if the opponent doesn't have 8 mana sitting around. Potentially the more Impressive part is the 1-1 one, one token that is given to the opponents, which can block, so it's just a, a random 1-1 one, one attacker. So you can easily take a few hits from the 1-1 one, one token. So if the opponent is mostly working with ground creatures, they're going to be attacking into the 8-8's Pursuit Whale, and slowly, one by one, all the opponent's creatures are going to die. And you can leave the opponent with the 1-1 one, one token for as long as possible. And then even in the event where the opponent can get rid of the Pursued Whale, they will still be left with that 1-1 token that will force them to attack, which might force them to attack into bigger blockers, and that's going to be a disaster. So they might be forced to eventually also use a removal spell on the 1-1 token. Yeah, this seems like a nightmare to deal with for uh, the opponent. So if you can get to 7 mana, you do get yourself a pretty good deal. Now, if your opponent has a bunch of flying creatures out, then this doesn't necessarily save you. So that's the one exception where this card could be a bit underwhelming. But outside of that, I'm pretty high on Pursued Whale. At the very least a B+, plus, if not an A-. minus. But uh, I'm definitely a fan, very flavorful card as well. Next up we have another reprint with Reign of Revelation. 4 mana for an instant that lets us draw 3 and then discard a card. So this is the instant speed version of Sift, which was already a pretty decent card. So they made it even better. 
in uh, Modern Horizons, which is where this was printed first. So yeah, nice card draw spell. Plays well alongside counter spell, so you can keep up your cancel, and if you don't need to cast cancel, you get to cast Reign of Revelation. So I'm a fan, probably in the B range, maybe closer to B minus, but I'll just go for B. Then we've got Read the Tides, six mana sorcery that lets us choose one between drawing three cards or returning up to two target creatures to their owner's hands. So I like the flexibility here, because sometimes when uh, you play too many of these expensive card draw spells, you tend to fall behind on board, but at least here we have the flexibility of using it as a bound spell as well. Of course, ideally, you prefer drawing three cards, but uh, sometimes if you're desperate, you get to bounce two creatures instead. But uh, still, definitely a playable card, so I'll give this a C. Rewind is back, two and double blue for an instant. Counterspell that untaps up to four lands afterwards. Yeah, not a particularly exciting counterspell at four mana, pretty pricey. But uh, maybe in a very dedicated instant speed counterspell control deck, this could be okay. So I'll probably just give it a D. Then we've got a riddle form, reprinted from Hour of Devastation. One and a blue for an enchantment, saying whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you may have riddle form become a 3-3 Sphinx creature with flying, in addition to its other types, until end of turn. And then for two and a blue, you get to scry one, so you even get a nice mana sink in the late game. So, riddle form, at its best in the blue-red spells archetype, where you're going to be casting all sorts of cheap cantrips to enable the riddle form. And uh, yeah, in that deck, riddle form is pretty good. Outside of the blue-red spells deck, you're probably not super interested in it. But uh, in the blue-red spells deck, this is probably a C+. And that's one of the few decks that's going to want this. And then, uh, yeah, the mana sink also can be underestimated once you get to the late game. This can scry you towards the relevant cards in the deck. And it also dodges sorcery speed removal, which is worth pointing out. Then we've got a roaming ghost light, five mana common spirits. It's a three two flyer, and when it enters a battlefield, it returns up to one target non spirit creature to its owner's hand. This seems very good. Three two flyer for five mana, and we get to bounce something. And it's even on a common. This has to be the best common in blue. I think I'm giving this a B, just seems a great uh, tempo play and uh, adds a nice evasive creature to the board. And there's not that many spirits in the set, so the drawback of not being able to bounce spirits is probably not gonna be super relevant. Now it does only have two toughness, so it does die to some pretty cheap removal spells, but still a very powerful card, especially for a common. So I'm happy with a B. Then we've got Rookie Mistake, a single blue for an instant. Until end of turn, target creature gets plus O plus two, and another target creature gets minus two minus O. You do get a nice uh, comma trick here for one mana. The problem is, cards in limited these days are typically playable. There's not that many F rating cards in limited. So that means that uh, the weaker cards are just not going to end up making the final cut. And I think this is one of those where, sure, this could be playable. Just reading the card, there's nothing wrong about it. But how often is this going to make the final cut? Probably not very often. Maybe in a more low-curve, aggressive blue deck that just wants to play lots of cheap spells. Maybe like a blue-red spells type deck. This uh, might make the cut, but generally speaking, maybe more of a sideboard card against aggressive decks. But I don't think this makes the main deck very often, so I'll give it a D. Then we've got a Rousing Reed, two and a blue for an enchantment aura. Enchants a creature, and when Rousing Reed enters the battlefield, draw two and then discard a card. And the enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and has flying. So... This is the enchantment I was talking about earlier when talking about the uh, Falcon Maker and uh, when talking about the uh, Library Larsenist that could synergize well with it. So there's quite a few powerful synergies and this is pretty reminiscent of the Blue Cartouche from uh, Amonkhet, which was quite good. 
So we're paying a bit more, but we get to draw an additional card and discard a card as well. So yeah, Rising Reed's pretty good. And uh, just got to make sure to cast this when the coast is clear so you don't get two for ones. So you at least get to draw two discard out of it first. So I like C plus on the Rousing Reed. Nice enabler and uh, has quite a bit of synergy across multiple archetypes. Then we have another Sanctum, Sanctum of Calm Waters. Three and a blue for Legendary Enchantment Shrine. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you may draw X cards where X is the number of shrines you control. And if you do, discard a card. So if you just have the single Sanctum of Calm Waters, it's not particularly exciting. But once you get multiple shrines going in the uh, shrine deck, it could be pretty powerful. But uh, yeah, the verdict is still out on the shrine deck, whether or not it's going to be a real thing. But uh, I'll give this a pretty conservative D rating for now. But I'm hoping that we'll be able to draft the shrine deck at some point featuring the Calm Waters. Cedar Truth is a one and a blue sorcery at rare. Let's us look at the top three cards of our library, put one of those into our hand and the rest on the bottom. And if this spell was cast from anywhere other than your hands, you get to draw three instead. So for limited, I can't think of many ways that you can enable See the Truth. So this is mostly a card to brew with and construct it where there's more ways to potentially enable it, thinking of uh, Finale. But for limited purposes, this is probably a D. I don't see this being all that exciting. This is also Sorcery. So in uh, comparison to some of the instant speed card draw effects to potentially enable Prowess at instant speed, this doesn't even do it. So yeah, not that excited about this. So just purely a card for Constructed, so I'll give it a D. Technically still playable if you just need a, a random filler card. Shacklegeist, one and a blue for a Spirit at a rare. It's a 2-2 two -two flyer, and Shacklegeist can only block flying creatures. And you can tap two untapped spirits you control to tap target creature you don't control. So you will need one additional spirit to make that work. But uh, yeah, if you're an aggressive blue deck, so the blue-white flyers deck or the blue-red spells deck, those are probably the more aggressive blue decks. Those are going to be very happy with a 2-2 flyer, even if it can block. And then the ability is just pure upside. Not too many spirits in the set, but we did see that 5-mana uh, roaming ghost lights, which was a spirit. So that's going to synergize quite well with the Shacklegeist in a more tempo-oriented blue deck. And in that deck, I could see Shacklegeist definitely overperforming. But uh, in a more controlling blue deck, you're not going to be super interested. So in the decks that want it, Shacklegeist is at the very least a C+. Then we've got Shipwreck Dowser. Three and double blue for a 3-3 Merfolk Wizard at Uncommon. Definitely a big upgrade. Instead of a 2-2, we get a 3-3 with Prowess. That returns target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. Shipwreck Dowser seems quite good. Also comparing it to the experimental overloads that we saw the blue red uncommon. This also seems like quite a big upgrade. We're paying one more mana, but we get a 3-3 prowess instead of an XX weird, which might be quite a bit smaller. Yeah, Shipwreck Dowser gets a B rating for me. Seems like a very solid card. Spined Megalodon is a 7 mana 5 7 shark with hexproof. And when the Megalodon attacks, you get to scry one. So earlier I uh, mentioned when talking about dub that we might be able to recreate the Coldwater Snapper plus enchantments. And here's our Coldwater Snapper. It is 7 mana as opposed to 6, which is definitely quite a bit pricier. But we do get a 5-7, and we get to scry 1 whenever we attack, so we do get a small upgrade for the additional mana cost. And, you know, Hexproof. I'm not a fan of the keyword, but it is powerful. That's definitely undeniable. So pair this with Dub to give it first strike, a Rousing Reed to give it plus 1 plus 1 and flying, and you've got yourself uh, a pretty difficult uh, to deal with threat 
that's going to end the game in a few attacks. I think the Megalodon, despite being pretty expensive, is going to end up overperforming. So I'm willing to give this a C+. Stormwing Entity is a 5 mana, rare elemental, and costs 2 and a blue less to cast if we've cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn. And then we get a 3-3 flyer with prowess that when it enters the battlefield lets us scry 2. Seems like a pretty powerful card. So yeah, just paying 3 mana for a 3-3 flying prowess with an optor shock seems quite good. So yeah, I'm a fan. Stormwing Entity, gonna be at its best in the blue-red spells archetype where you get to leverage prowess at its best. So in that deck it might be even slightly better than the rating I'm gonna give it, but I'm gonna give it a B. But it's maybe gonna be closer to a B plus A in the blue-red prowess deck, but still quite good outside of it. Next up we have Sublime Epiphany, 6 mana for a rare instant that lets us choose one or more between countering target spell, Countering target activated or triggered ability, returning target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, creating a token that's a copy of target creature we control, and target player draws a card. So the second mode of countering an activated or triggered ability probably not going to be used all that often. Countering target spell is going to depend. Are we ahead on board and can we afford to wait and counter spell? Or are we behind on boards, in which case we might not have the luxury of waiting until we can counter something. But then the beauty of this card is that it does still do something if we're behind on board. We can still bounce one of the opponent's uh, non-land permanents, as well as making a token from one of our creatures and drawing a card, which for six mana is still a pretty good deal. But then if we get to live the dream of also countering a spell, then uh, it's of course even better. But I do want to stress that this card is still good even if you're behind on board, which is what makes this card quite powerful, because if you are at parity or ahead on board, this will definitely secure the win. So, big fan of the Sublime Epiphany, might be one of the better rares in blue. So I'll give this an A. Next up we have Teferi, Master of Time. We can activate loyalty abilities on Teferi, on any player's turn, any time we could cast an instant. We can essentially activate Teferi's abilities twice per turn cycle, once in our turn, once in the opponent's turn. And then the first plus one ability lets us draw a card and then discard a card. So we don't get to gain card advantage, it's just card selection. But we do get to potentially do it twice per turn cycle. So we get to see a lot of cards by the time we untap again with Teferi. So we can play Teferi, plus to 4, maybe in the opponent's turn, plus to 5, untap, and have a 5 loyalty Teferi ready to go. Then we can use the minus 3 ability, which says target creature you don't control phases out. This is the only card in the set referencing phasing, and uh, it might sound daunting at first. It's not that difficult to wrap your head around. Just imagine when phasing out a creature that it just ceases to exist for a brief moment in time. All the counters that are on the creatures are gonna be gone, but they will reappear as soon as the creature phases back in. Same goes for any enchantments that are attached to it. So you don't exile it, you just phase it out. It disappears, it can't attack or block because it doesn't exist. And then once it phases back in, everything is back the way it used to be. Now, the interesting thing is that we can use the minus three during the opponent's turn as well. So imagine the opponent attacks the fairy with a large creature, then you can still decide to use the minus three instead of using the plus one to phase that creature out so it doesn't deal any damage to the fairy. So that can potentially make it tricky for the opponent to attack. If you've got some blockers out there, you can just phase out the opponent's largest creature and still block the other ones. So it's a pretty tricky card to play with and against. And then if we ever get to the minus 10 and take two extra turns, we should probably win the game. But for the most part, we're just going to be using the plus one a bunch, making life difficult for the opponents, phase some creatures out, draw some cards, discard some cards, and just waste a lot of the opponent's time and attack steps and uh, eventually win the game some other way. So Teferi is not so much a win condition as just a way to 
by yourself a lot of time and that's kind of like the name implies the fairy master of time so still a pretty good card probably not as busted as some of the previous teferis we've seen but nevertheless a force to be reckoned with so i'm happy giving teferi a b plus at the very least might go all the way up to an a but uh, i'll start with the conservative b plus next up we have teferi's ageless insight four mana for a legendary enchantment that says if you would draw a card except the first one you draw in each of your draw steps draw two cards instead it is a pretty slow enchantment we're setting up to potentially reap the rewards with our future card draw spells but if we're spending four mana on this enchantment and then spending more mana on card draw we're spending a lot of mana not affecting the board which is a scary proposition but of course the reward is there if you can play this and the game goes long you can potentially draw a ton of extra cards but i still wouldn't rate this particularly highly so i'll start with conservative c on the fairies inside here but uh, definitely a card with a lot of potential next up we have the fairies protege two and a blue for a two three human wizard and for one and a blue we can tap it to draw a card and then discard a card so three mana two threes fluctuates in playability some sets a two three is fine uh, this is also wizard although there's no particular wizard synergies in the set unlike dominaria for instance but we do get a nice looting ability so in the late game the protege is probably not going to be attacking all that much but it plays defense well and then we can just start looting away additional lands so that's still pretty useful couple synergies with drawing cards in blue green couple cards in blue that synergize with drawing extra cards so overall i don't mind the uh, protege too much probably give it a c plus having mana sinks in a late game is definitely quite valuable then we've got teferi's tutelage two and a blue for an uncommon enchantment and when teferi's tutelage enters the battlefield draw a card and then discard a card so we get to loot once but the reason we want to play the tutelage is whenever we draw a card target opponent mills two cards so this is essentially what psychic corrosion did but this is even better because when it enters the battlefield we get to draw and discard which will trigger the tutelage itself and mill the opponent for two if you can draft a nice controlling deck with a bunch of defensive creatures maybe some counter spells some removal and then Teferi's Tutelage can be your win condition and just mill the opponent out. Wants to be in a pretty specific deck. Doesn't go in a blue-white flyers deck, doesn't go in the blue-red spells deck, but maybe in a more controlling blue-black deck this could fit in nicely. Can potentially mill the opponent pretty quickly if you've got some other uh, draw synergies in your deck. I'll give it a C+. Definitely a card with a lot of potential. Just keep in mind that not every deck wants this. Tide Skimmer, 3 and a blue for a 2-3 uncommon drake with flying and whenever you attack with two or more creatures that have flying you get to draw a card. So excellent card for the blue-white flyers archetype but uh, most blue decks are gonna have a couple flying creatures in it and if you do get to consistently draw additional cards with Tide Skimmer that does start adding up. You don't even have to attack with Tide Skimmer itself. If you have two other flying creatures, you can play Tide Skimmer and in the very same turn already draw an extra card. Tide Skimmer seems good. Think uh, C plus level good with uh, potentially quite a bit of upside in the right deck. Then we've got Tolarian Kraken. Six mana for a Kraken at uncommon. It's a four six. And whenever you draw a card, you may pay one mana and when you do, you may tap or untap target creature. This is a pretty tricky card to evaluate. So six mana for a four six looks more like a good defensive creature. And you know, four six blocks pretty well, but then the ability is more prone to being good in an aggressive deck where you can draw for the turn, pay one mana, tap the opponent's biggest blocker so you can start attacking. You can potentially still use the ability defensively if you have instant speed card draw where you can maybe draw in the opponent's turn before attackers are declared and tap down 
one of their creatures for one mana. Yeah, I'm not sure where I land on the Tolarian Kraken. It has a bit of an identity crisis where it's half an aggressive card and half a defensive card. At the same time, it costs six mana, so it's pretty pricey. And a 4-6, while it does deal a decent chunk of damage, for six mana you expect maybe a bit more damage. Not the biggest fan of the Tolarian Kraken, but it's definitely playable, so I'll give it a C. Next up we have Tomb Anima, three and a blue for a 3-3 three, three spirit. And Tomb Anima can be blocked as long as you've drawn two or more cards this turn. So another payoff for drawing additional cards. Four mana for a 3-3, three, three, not an exciting card, but you know, at least adds a bit of power and toughness to the board. So you could do worse. And then once you do stabilize the board, and start drawing extra cards. This does turn into a reasonable evasive creature to get in some damage. It's a spirit, there's a couple small spirit synergies, although mostly at higher rarities. Not an exciting card, but I think it's playable. I'll give it a C. Next up we've got a reprint of Unsubstantiate from uh, Eldritch Moon, I believe. One on a blue for an uncommon instant that returns target spell or creature to its owner's hand. So when we say target spell, we mean something that's still on the stack. So it can potentially delay one of the opponent's uh, non-creature spells, or if a creature has an enter the battlefield ability, you can also delay that. And then it's also an unsummon that can bounce the opponent's creature, but it can also bounce your own creature. So yeah, it's a versatile card. It's not always worth an entire card, so maybe you want to complement it with some card draw to make up for the tempo advantage gained by it, but uh, definitely a playable card at its best in the blue-red spells deck where you've got some prowess synergies maybe. So I'll give it a C. Then we've got another reprint of the Vodalian Arcanist, one on a blue for a 1-3 Merfolk Wizard at common, first seen in Dominaria, and taps to add colorless mana to our mana pool that we can only spend to cast instant or sorcery spells. So definitely cards I remember underestimating in Dominaria, although that card was also better in Dominaria because we had those wizard synergies which we don't necessarily have this time around. That being said, it is still a good card. A 1-3 is a relevant blocker in the early game, can trade off for opposing two drops out of aggressive decks, and then it's still relevant in the late game as it can help us make mana for card draw spells. Yeah, a two drop that's fine early and still relevant late is uh, what I'm hoping for out of most of my two drops so that fits that description so despite the lack of wizard synergies I'm still pretty happy with the arcanist as long as I've got some ways to make use of the extra mana so I'll give it a C plus I'm pretty high on the arcanist next up we have a waker of waves seven mana for a seven seven whale that says creatures your opponents control get minus one minus oh. And for one on a blue we can discard Waker of Waves to look at the top two cards of our library, put one of them into our hand and the other one into our graveyard. So reminiscent of a sleight of hand effect. So we do get a nice bit of flexibility. If we're in the early game and don't have a lot of lands, we can just use the ability and to get a bit of card advantage, or I should say card selection, since we're not really drawing any additional cards. But we are filling the graveyard, potentially, for some reanimation spells. So that could come up, so maybe this is good in blue-black. And then once we do get a 7-7 seven, seven, that shrinks the opposing team, it's not bad. I'm willing to give this a C+, plus just because of the flexibility of being able to essentially cycle it for two mana or cast it in the late game. So similar to the cycling cards we've seen in Ikoria. Wall of Runes also makes a return from War of the Spark. One mana for an 0-4 defender and when Wall of Runes enters the battlefield we get to scry one. So there's no real defender synergy in uh, Corset 2021 where defenders get to deal damage equal to their toughness. But it is still a nice cheap defensive creature, so this could be something to play in the blue-white flyers deck to hold off any ground creatures while you attack with your flying creatures. 
this could be okay in the controlling blue mill deck where you just want to protect your life total and then start milling the opponent by drawing a bunch of cards with uh, Teferi's tutelage in play. So I think Wall of Runes does fill a role in a lot of blue archetypes. Still not an exciting card, but I think a playable one. So I'm giving uh, Wall of Runes a C. Wishcoin Crab makes a return. First seen in Guilds of Ravnica, next seen in my Twitch chat, and now back in Corset 2021. Four mana for a 2-5 Crab. Nice and simple. Now the reason this card was good in Guilds of Ravnica was that uh, it lined up pretty well against some of the 4-4 creatures from Selesnya, it lined up well against the aggressive Boros Mentor deck, which was all over the place. So it's not necessarily the case that the Wishcon Cramp's gonna be as much of an overperformer this time around. That being said, it's still a nice defensive creature, so I can make the same speech I made just a second ago when talking about Wall of Runes, so it kind of fits into, into the same archetypes. So I expect Wishcoin Tramp to be a playable card, so at the very least a C. Our first black card is Alchemist's Gift, single black for an instant, giving target creature plus one plus one, and our choice of lifelink or death touch until end of turn. So the death touch half is reminiscent of the uh, split card status statue from Guilds of Ravnica, which was decent, um, although we mostly played that card for the statue half. That being said, Gift is still pretty efficient at one mana, and uh, we do have the flexibility of both Death Touch and Life Link, so I don't mind the Alchemist Gift, still a combo trick and still somewhat conditional in nature, so probably just give it a C but potentially combines nicely with First Strike or Double Strike. Next up we have Archfiend's Vessel, single black mana for an uncommon human cleric with a lifelink, and when the vessel enters the battlefield, if it entered from your graveyard, or you cast it from your graveyard, exile it, and if you do, make a 5-5 black demon creature token with flying. Yeah, this doesn't seem amazing, I've looked over the entire set and there's only really two ways of reanimating creatures. One was the blue-black Stitcher that we saw earlier at Uncommon, and then there's a common 5-mana reanimation spell. So that's probably the main way of comboing with the Vessel. So if we're paying 5-mana to make a 5-5 five five black demon with flying, that is pretty good but it also requires the Vessel being in the graveyard to begin with, and drawing both cards. So yeah, it's pretty conditional in nature, and 1 mana for a 1-1 one -one lifelink is not great, as it doesn't have any threat of activation like we saw in white. Yeah, not that high on the Vessel. Potentially quite a bit of synergy in Constructed, as we have more ways of uh, getting it back from the graveyard, thinking of Lurus, for instance. But uh, yeah, for limited, this is probably a D. Then we've got Bad Deal, 6 mana for a sorcery at uncommon. You draw 2 cards, each opponent discards 2 cards, and then each player loses 2 life. Yeah, it's not a terrible deal, but it's still not a great deal. So I guess Bad Deal's kind of appropriate. Problem here is that at 6 mana, the opponent might already be empty-handed, so discard 2 is not always going to be relevant. We're essentially left with 6 mana to draw 2 and lose 2 life. That's not that great. This is a card that probably gets better in sealed as opposed to in drafts, since sealed tends to be a bit slower, people might be stranded with more cards in hand, so I could see bad deal being okay in sealed. But for drafts, this is probably going to be a tad too slow, even if it potentially could be a 4 for 1. So probably still go with a D but with the caveat that in sealed, or if your opponent's playing a very slow deck, this can potentially come out of the sideboard. Next up we have Blood Glutton, 5 mana for a 4-3 Vampire with a lifelink. So doesn't seem amazing at first glance, and I'm not going to claim that it is an amazing card, but it is a card with a lot of synergy in the set, a lot of cards that care about gaining 3 life in one turn, 
and this is definitely a way of enabling it. It's also a card that's pretty difficult to race as a 4-3 lifelink, especially if you enhance it with some other enchantment, giving it flying, or first strike, or giving it evasion some other way. I think this is going to be one of those cards that ends up overperforming a little bit. I'll just give it a C rating for now, but uh, expect it to potentially exceed expectations as it synergizes well with some of the other commons in the set. Then we've got Caged Zombie, 2 and a black for a 2-3 zombie at common. And for 1 and a black we can tap it, and then each opponent loses 2 life, but we can only activate this if a creature died this turn. So, unlike the Protégé in blue, this is probably a little bit less exciting as a mana sink in a late game, since it's much more conditional in nature. It's still playable. There's a couple small zombie synergies in the sets, which make this a bit better, but it's still not an exciting card, so probably a C at best. Then we've got Carrion Grub, three and a black for an insect at Uncommon, and we get a five toughness creature that gets plus X plus O, where X is the greatest power among creature cards in our graveyard, and when a grub enters the battlefield we mill four cards, Especially in like a black-green deck, you can expect to have some bigger creatures in there. I don't hate uh, the Carrion Grub, probably a C+, and uh, potentially has some neat synergies in the set, as we'll get to in a second. And here is one part of the combo to potentially go with Carrion Grub. Crypt Lurker, 4 mana for a 3-4 horror, and when a Lurker enters the battlefield you may sacrifice a creature or discard a creature card, and if you do draw a card, so 4 mana for a 3-4 is not exciting, but we do get a nice little bonus attached where we can maybe sacrifice a small creature or a token, or maybe a creature that's enchanted by some removal spell, or we can discard an expensive creature that we don't have the mana to cast yet. So it's just pure upside and we don't have to do anything with it. Still wouldn't give this an incredibly high rating, probably just a C, maybe it gets up to a C+. Plus. Definitely a, a neat little common. And next up we've got a nice reprint, Deathbloom Thalad from Dominaria. 3 mana for a 3-2 fungus, and when the Thalad dies it leaves behind a 1-1 green sapperling creature token. One of my favorite cards from Dominaria, has a very good defensive creature to hold off those aggressive decks. And this is a card that definitely punishes 1-toughness creatures. So we saw a couple 1-toughness creatures in white, thinking of that 3-1 unicorn that this can hold off with the Sapperling token. Definitely a card that tends to overperform, so I'll give it a C+. And next up we've got a pretty exciting rare, Demonic Embrace. Now I'm typically a hater of auras, but this one's a bit different. For 3 mana we get an enchantment aura, gives the enchanted creature plus 3 plus 1 and flying, and it's a demon in addition to its other types, I guess relevant for Baneslayer Angel. And then we can cast Demonic Embrace from our graveyard by paying 3 life and discarding a card in addition to paying its other costs. So where typically there's a lot of drawbacks involved with playing Auras, here we can potentially replay the Embrace from the graveyard. We do have to discard a card, so maybe discard a land in a late game so it's not that bad. And then we can keep making this giant's flying threat, especially pairs nicely with lifelink creatures, Pairs quite well with uh, cards that have some sort of trigger when they attack. Thinking of that uh, creature that could make the Falcon token. Thinking of that 1-2 uh, creature in blue that draws a card whenever we attack with it. So there's a lot of synergies that we can potentially enable with it. And just turning any of our creatures into a giant flying threat that has to be dealt with. And then most cases where the opponent kills a creature, we can just replay the Embrace out of the graveyard. Now there are exceptions, if the opponent has like a Capture Sphere or Fates Feathers, then they could potentially keep the Embrace on that same creature until we find a way of getting rid of it, or maybe sacrificing our own creature. But there are a few Sacrifice Outlets in black to still potentially get rid of it, so I think Embrace is going to be one of the better rares in black and I'm willing to give it an A. Next up we have Duress, reprinted once again. 
typically just a pure sideboard card and uh, not a card I'm happy to main deck, but every now and then you'll board this in if your opponent's running a very controlling deck with lots of non-creature spells. But uh, yeah, just a pure sideboard card. I'll give it a D. Next up we have Eliminate, one on a black for an instant and uncommon that destroys target creature or planeswalker with converted mana cost three or less. Planeswalker parts could be relevant if you're facing the white planeswalker, I guess. But uh, for the most part, we're looking at destroying a creature with converted mana cost three or less at instant speed, which this does a decent job of. So it's a fine card. It's going to miss some of the more impactful creatures, but uh, still a card I'm happy to have. Pretty efficient at two mana. I'll give it a C plus. Then we've got Fetid Imp reprinted from Magic Origins. So it's been a while. One on a black for a 1-2 Imp with flying. And for one black mana, we can give it Death Touch until end of turn. So not a great creature on offense, but pretty fine creature on defense, holding off both ground creatures and flyers alike. But uh, still not an exciting card, so probably a C at its best. Then we've got Finishing Blow. Four and a black for an instant at common that destroys target creature or planeswalker. So the planeswalker part, nice to have access to, but not the main reason why we're playing it. Destroying a creature for 5 mana, not particularly efficient, but sometimes it's uh, the only removal you've got to work with, and at least it's unconditional in nature, so can get rid of any enormous creature the opponent might have on their side of the battlefield. I'll give Finishing Blow a B-, just because it's maybe not quite as desirable as one of the next removal spells we'll see at common which is a Grasp of Darkness. I think I have Grasp of Darkness over Finishing Blow, so I want to make the distinction between the two. So I'll give this a B- and Grasp of Darkness a B. But uh, still, definitely a solid removal spell that you're relatively happy to have. Although, once you start adding too many copies of Finishing Blow, they do become pretty clunky, so you don't want to have infinite of these. And then we've got a Gloom Sower. 7 mana for an 8-6 horror at common, and when Gloom Sower becomes blocked by a creature, that creature's controller loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. So this is potentially a card that could combo well with that previous Carrion Grub we've seen, whose uh, power equals the largest power of a creature in your graveyard, and this being a 7 mana card is potentially something we can discard to the 4 mana Crypt Lurker, and then uh, that's kind of a three card combo with Gloom Sower, Crypt Lurker, and Carrion Grub, two of them being commons, so potentially could be something you can set up. Seven mana for an 8 6, it is pricey, it's a creature without too much relevant text, but it is big, and if the opponent doesn't answer it, it's gonna deal a lot of damage, and chum blocking it is not the best solution. So, as far as big creatures go, this is not a terrible one, but still don't want too many of these being uh, 7 mana, so I'll give it a C. Next up we have a Gormand, 6 mana for a 5-5 demon at uncommon, and as an additional cost to cast this you have to sacrifice a creature, and then we get a 5-5 flyer with trample, and when it enters the battlefield each opponent sacrifices a creature. So we have to sacrifice one in order to cast it, but then the opponent also has to sacrifice one, so it's only fair. And we do get a pretty sizable threat, 5-5 five, five Flying Trample, so it's probably going to dominate the skies unless there's a Baneslayer Angel. So you do need to enable it, hopefully you've got some sacrifice fodder that you don't mind getting rid of, but uh, once you get to play Gormand, it's going to be the uh, biggest thing in play. So yeah, I don't mind it, probably give it a B, maybe B-. minus. Then we've got the Grasp of Darkness, which I was referencing just a second ago. Double black for an instant at common. Target creature gets minus four, minus four until end of turn. Reprinted from Oath of the Gatewatch, where it was originally an uncommon, so downshifted in rarity. And yeah, this card's quite good. Double black, maybe not the easiest mana cost to cast on turn two, but still a very impactful card later in the game. Minus four, minus four gets rid of most. Threats maybe misses a few big green creatures or some six and seven drops, 
but for the most part minus four minus four will get the job done can still just use it as a way to shrink down the opponent's creature and then block it in combats and finish it off that way typically better than just dealing damage to a creature so a big fan of grasp of darkness i think this is going to be the slightly better removal spell over finishing blow but both of them are quite playable so i think i'll give this a b where i gave finishing blow a b minus and then we've got a Grim Tutor, one and double black for a Mythic Rare Sorcery. Let's us search our library for a card and put that card into our hand and lose three life. Not a fan of Tutor effects in general, this one also costs three life. Typically Tutor effects in Limiteds are not that great, especially once they get to three or four mana, where the tempo loss of casting it doesn't really make up for whatever card selection you got. So this is just a D. Maybe there's a rare case where you have an absolutely unbeatable bomb, like an Ugin or some other very powerful rare that uh, can win a game single-handedly, and then you'll consider playing Grim Tutor as a way of searching it up. But that's gonna come up very rarely. Then we've got Hooded Blightfang, two and a black for a 1-4 snake with death touch at rare saying whenever a creature you control with death touch attacks each opponent loses one life and you gain one life and whenever a creature you control deals death touch damage to a planeswalker then you get to destroy that planeswalker so that's probably how death touch should work to begin with but uh, i'll take it i like the blight fan quite a bit nice payoff for death touch can maybe build a constructed deck with this and uh, four mana vraska from war of the spark but uh just for limited, a solid card with uh, a nice bit of upside for other potential death touch creatures. We saw the Fetid Imp earlier, could potentially synergize with the Blind Fang as well. And 1-4 uh, means it's a very good blocker. Maybe not the best attacker in the sense that the opponent can easily double block it and only lose one creature. Still, pretty solid card and I'm happy with the C plus for Hooded Blind Fang. Infernal Scarring, one on a black for an aura that enchants a creature, giving it plus two plus so, and when that creature dies, draw a card. Reprinted a few times now, never liked it, still don't like it. Just uh, prone to getting two for ones against bound spells, enchantment based removal, against uh, exile based effects. There's just so many ways you can punish Infernal Scarring, and then when it doesn't get punished, the payoff is two mana to get a plus two plus so on a creature, which isn't even all that great. Yeah, pretty bad cards. But uh, if you're scraping for playables, I guess this will do. Maybe you've got some indestructible creatures or some hexproof creatures to combo with it, but still not a very high pick, so I'll give it a D. Next up we have Karvac, the Spiteful. Four mana for a 3-2, a legendary human warlock, saying other creatures get minus one, minus one. So we get a Knight of Souls Betrayal on a stick. And uh, yeah, this is a pretty unique effect. Don't see that very often. It is symmetrical, so it affects the opponent, but it also affects our creatures. Other than Karvac, the advantage is that you see it coming, so you can potentially set up an attack and deal a bit of damage to the opponent's creatures and then play Karvac and finish off some creatures that have uh, just a single point of life to spare but it is still symmetrical, so it's not that easy to break the symmetry other than the turn you play Karvek. Definitely shines against Go White aggressive decks in white and any token makers. So I'll go C plus on Karvek, but I could be surprised and it might end up in the B range instead. Then we've got a reprint of Kainzil Freebooter, first seen in Ixalan, one on a blank for a 1-2 human pirate with flying. And when a freebooter enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals their hand, and you can choose a non-creature, non-land card, and exile it for as long as the freebooter is on the battlefield. So a nice little disruptive creature, get to gain a bit of information looking at the opponent's hand, and take away maybe this, the only removal spell they have, so they can get rid of the freebooter, at the same time putting a 1-2 flyer in play. So, does a lot of work for just 2 mana, and has seen plenty of constructed play, so... Expect this to be around a C plus in limited. We've got another Planeswalker with a Liliana, Waker of the Dead. Two and double black for a four loyalty Liliana. Plus one ability makes each player discard a card and each opponent who can't loses a three life. 
so the life loss isn't symmetrical but the discard is and then the minus three says target creature gets minus x minus x on turn of turn where x is the number of cards in your graveyard it does require a little bit of setup although the plus one ability also fuels the minus three ability so there's a bit of cross synergy there and if you can play Liliana minus kill something significant and then untap with an active planeswalker that's always a nice feeling since you get to control the uh, plus one and discard ability hopefully you're empty-handed so the op opponent is the only one discarding and then the minus seven if you can get to it is also game winning yeah i like liliana it's not the most powerful planeswalker ever printed but definitely still quite good so i'll give liliana b plus liliana's devotee two and a blank for an uncommon human warlock giving zombies you control plus one plus oh it's a two three and at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay one on a black. And if you do, you get to make a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature token. So this is probably at its best in the Golgari archetype that cares about creatures dying. And you've got some small synergies there with all sorts of cards that trigger off creatures dying. Liliana's Devotee, one of them. And uh, yeah, zombies you control get plus one plus so, so... Here's our payoff for the zombie tribe. It's not a very big payoff. This is, I think, the only card that cares about zombies. But still, this card is already good by itself. And the plus one plus so to zombies is just pure upside. So Devotee seems quite good. I'm willing to give this a B. Then we've got Liliana's Standard Bearer. Two and a black for a 3-1 zombie knight with flash. And when the standard bearer enters the battlefield, draw X cards where X is the number of creatures that died under your control this turn. So only looks at our creatures, but we can play it in the opponent's turn if we want to. So we can kind of engineer a board state where two or three creatures die and trade. And we get to play the standard bearer. So if you're facing someone that might be holding up standard bearer, maybe think twice about trading off your entire board. So yeah, card seems good. And it's not too difficult to draw one or two cards from it. And then we still get a 3-1 for 3 mana, which is not too bad. So I'm giving this a B as well. Next up we have Liliana's Steward. One mana for a 1-2 zombie that we can tap and sacrifice to make target opponent discard a card. And we can only do this at sorcery speed. So normally Steward would not be an exciting card. But I think there's quite a few synergies that make it maybe a worthwhile inclusion especially in black green where we have a few cards that care about creatures dying we had twin blade assassins that let us draw cards if a creature died we just looked at the standard bearer which can also draw a card if a creature died we had uh, liliana's devotee which could make a zombie token if a creature died so those are the types of cards we want to combine with liliana's steward and then it's also an extra creature to potentially end up in the graveyard to count for any graveyard synergies. Potentially also just a creature we can play and then sacrifice to another effect, even if it's not the ability to make the opponent discard a card. So still not an amazing card, but I think it's far from unplayable just because of all those tiny synergies. So I'll give this a C. And speaking of tiny synergies, this is another one that could synergize with uh, Liliana Steward Malefic Scythe. One on a black for an uncommon artifact equipment. And as the Scythe enters the battlefield, it enters the battlefield with a soul counter on it. And the equipped creature gets plus one plus one for each soul counter on the Scythe. And when the equipped creature dies, you can put an additional soul counter on the Scythe and equips for just one mana. Just starting out, it's slightly more expensive than the short sword which was one mana to play one to equip this is one and a black to play one to equip for plus one plus one but this will start accumulating those soul counters over time and there's a few ways to easily enable it like the liliana steward and there's a couple more that fit that description and then uh, it's not too difficult to get this to give plus two plus two plus three plus three and it's only gonna grow over time and the investment is not too high so i'm a fan of the scythe i like the design i think it's gonna play out quite well and seems 
like an above average card. Yeah, I'll give the scythe a C plus. Next up we have the Masked Black Guard, one on a black for a human rogue. At common it's a 2-1 with flash, and for 2 on a black it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So reminiscent of Hired Blade from the previous core set. This is Hired Blade's cousin. And yeah, it's fine, it's not exciting, 2 mana for a 2-1. Even if we give it plus 1 plus 1 it's still probably gonna trade off for whatever creature that blocks it. But uh, can potentially ambush an opposing creature, and uh, if the opponent's not blocking it, we can potentially get a bit of extra damage out of it, so it's a fine to drop, nothing exciting, just a C. Now uh, this card is exciting, Massacre Worm is back, first seen in Mirrodin Besieged, 6 mana for a 6-5, Mythic Rare, Worm, and when Massacre Worm enters the battlefield, creatures your opponent's control get minus two, minus two until end of turn. This is one-sided. And whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, that player loses two life. So this is a static ability. So this will happen the turn the Massacre Worm comes into play and potentially massacres the opponent's board. But this will keep triggering if any creatures die later in the game too. And that life loss does start adding up. And at the same time we also get a 6-5 creature. So Massacre Worm doesn't mess around, it can completely wreck the opponent's board, especially if you play this in the second main phase after combat and maybe some uh, creatures were already dealt a bit of damage. And then we get a 6-5 that's gonna keep draining the opponent turn after turn. So this seems quite powerful and I think I'm willing to give this an S as it has a powerful enter the battlefield ability as well as a relevant body. Next up we have Mind Rot, reprinted once again, two and a black for a sorcery to make target player discard two cards. This is a card we've seen time and time again, kind of fluctuates between a D and a C, typically closer to a D, in sealed it might be closer to a C, where the format tends to be a little bit slower, but uh, Generally speaking, I'm leaning towards D for Mind Rot. Just a card that doesn't end up making the cut very often. There's not too much synergy with it. Card draw spells tend to be a better way of spending your mana than discard spells. Next up we have Necromantia. One and double black for a sorcery. Choose a card name other than basic land. And then search target opponent's a graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them and the opponent gets to make a 2-2 zombie creature token for each card exile this way from their hand. So similar to Unmoored Ego, instead of drawing cards they get 2-2 zombie. Yeah this is strictly a sideboard card for Constructed and I don't think there's any situation where you would uh, even consider bringing this in in Limited. So I think this is one of the few Fs that I'm gonna hand out. Next up we have Peer into the Abyss, 4 and triple black for sorcery. Target player draws cards equal to half of the number of cards in their library and loses half their life round up each time. Yeah, this card we are not gonna try and cast in any normal situation. If we target ourselves we're spending a lot of mana and a lot of life to draw some cards. And if we're targeting the opponents we are probably giving them too many additional resources to deal a bit of extra damage, so both cases are pretty bad. Now one scenario where I could see this being a nice combo kill is if we're playing Teferi's Tutelage, where we can mill the opponent for two cards for each card we draw. If we have Teferi's Tutelage, play this, draw half of our deck, and then mill the opponent for double that amount, we can essentially kill them on the spot. So I think that's the only scenario I can think of where I would want this, but it's still a pretty corner case. So I'll spare Peer into the Abyss from the F rating and just give it a D, but uh, yeah, don't expect this to make my deck very often. Next up we have Pestilent Haze, one and double black for a sorcery, and we have to choose one between all creatures get minus two minus two until end of turn, and remove two loyalty counters from each Planeswalker. Planeswalker parts not super relevant for limited, so we're mostly looking at giving all creatures minus two minus two until end of turn. We've seen these effects before, and they tend to be pretty decent. 
you do want to build your deck around it and of course you get to decide when you get to cast Pestilent Haze but uh, yeah, it can be pretty backbreaking if the opponent loses two or three creatures to it and you can potentially engineer a board state where you can attack first, deal a bit of damage and finish off some larger creatures too. If you're playing a very low curve aggressive deck then this is not a card you want, although from what we've seen in black it's not really a very aggressive color. So I like C plus on Pestilent Haze just because of the high upside potential it has, but it is a card that you can potentially consider boarding out if uh, the opponent's creatures are all enormous. Next up we have a Rise again, 4 and a black for sorcery, that returns a target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield at common. So this is an effect we've seen many times in recent sets at uncommon, finally demoted to common, I think that's probably where it belongs. It has a bit of synergy with that one mana uncommon that we saw earlier, the Archfiend's Vessel. So that's probably the best use we've seen for it so far. There is at common at 4 mana Crypt Lurker, which can help us discard cards. And in blue we also saw the Waker of Waves, which can kind of discard itself, and then we can reanimate it with Rise again. So those are some synergies that uh, we can find with it. But uh, outside of those synergies, I'm not a huge fan. So, probably give this a C. Then we've got Sanctum of Stone Fangs. One on a black for another one of those legendary enchantment shrines. But uh, this one's a little bit different. If you read the text, it might be reminiscent of a certain black enchantment from uh, a recent set. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life where X is the number of shrines you control. Ill-gotten inheritance, this isn't quite. We don't get that uh, final ability to drain the opponent for four. But the major difference maybe between this and inheritance is it's a different format. In Ravnica Legions, we had two pretty aggressive black decks with Ragdos and Orzov. And uh, black was also a color that cared about spectacle. So having a way to reliably deal damage to the opponent was important. We don't have those synergies here. We lose a lot of the context that made Ill-Gotten Inheritance potentially a powerful card. As I mentioned, black isn't particularly aggressive in the set, so something that drains the opponents. The life gain is nice, but the damage is not super relevant. So all things considered, Sanctum not as good as it might seem once we make the connection with Inheritance. That being said, it is only two mana, so this is definitely the most powerful shrine we've seen so far, and maybe even a card you could consider main decking without any additional shrine synergies, just as a way to maybe gain a bit of life and drain the opponent for a bit. At the end of the day, I'll give this a C+, and this could maybe be an incentive to end up in the shrine deck. You pick up a Sanctum of Stone Fangs early, you get past a couple Sanctums, and who knows, maybe you end up in some sort of multicolor monstrosity of a Sanctum deck. At least I hope that's what's going to happen. So I'll give a Sanctum of Stonefangs a C+, plus out of respect, but it could end up underperforming and just not making the cut. Next up we have Sanguine Indulgence. This is one of the payoffs for gaining life. Three and a black for sorcery, that costs three generic mana less to cast if we've gained three or more life this turn. And then we get to return up to two target creature cards from our graveyard to our hand. This one requires three life gains, which is a lot more difficult to enable. Although we did mention earlier, when talking about that five mana for three common, the blood glutton, that could potentially synergize quite well with the indulgence, a four three life link tends to trade off pretty often since the opponent doesn't want to keep taking four lifelink damage and then if it trades off we gain the three life necessary and we can get it back from the graveyard once again potentially just for one mana. Those two seem to combo quite well and they're both commons so that's definitely a synergy to keep in mind. I like Indulgence quite a bit if we can get those synergies going. Yeah I mean Dead Revels was a very good card in Ravnica Legions I don't think this is going to be quite as good as Dead Revels, but given that we don't have any substitute here, I think I'm still going to give this a C+, plus, just because we don't have a ton of card advantage in black otherwise. Silver Smote Ghoul, 2 and a black for a zombie vampire at Uncommon. Not often that you see those two creature types on the same card. 
and we get a 3-1 that says at the beginning of your end step, if you gained three or more life this turn, return the ghoul from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So another incentive for gaining life. And for one and a black, we can sacrifice a ghoul to draw a card. So if we gained life, we can make sure to get value by sacrificing the ghoul for one and a black first, and then on the end step we get the ghoul right back. So a nice uh, value engine. This is a type of card that Arena is going to remember to return from the graveyard. Might be a bit more difficult to remember in paper if the ghoul has been hanging out in your graveyard for a while and you all of a sudden gain three life. Has a lot of interesting applications for Constructed as well, thinking of Creeping Chill as a way to enable this in some sort of self-mill deck. So definitely look forward to brewing with it. And uh, for Limited, I'll give this a B. Then we've got Skeleton Archer, reprinted once again. Three and a black for a Skeleton Archer. The name says it all. And we get a 3-3 Skeleton Archer that uh, deals one damage when it enters a battlefield. Nice way to punish one toughness creatures. Can maybe combine with combat damage to finish off a larger creature. And can always go face if you don't find a better target. And we get a 3-3, which is not the end of the world. So I give Skeleton Archer C+. Pretty decent card. And next up we have a Tavern Swindler. One and a black for a human rogue at Uncommon, reprinted from a few sets, but mainly Return to Ravnica is where we saw it at first. And uh, we get a 2-2, two -two, and we can tap and pay three life, and then flip a coin, and if we win the flip, we gain six life. So we essentially net three life if we win the flip, otherwise we're down three life, so it's kind of 50-50 there. Now, this is a very interesting reprint in the set, mainly because of the life gain synergies. So in a black-white deck, where you have a couple cards that care about gaining at least three life, this is potentially a way to enable it. Now it is a coin flip, so it's kind of random whether or not you win the flip. But if you do, you gain six, which enables all those life gain synergies. And at the end of the day, you do still get a two mana 2-2, two -two, which, you know, can attack and block and trade off. So it's not the end of the world. So specifically in the black-white life gain deck, this might be playable. Outside of it, probably not so much, unless you just want to flip some coins. But there's better games to uh, flip coins in. I'll give Tavern Swindler a C, but I do want to note that uh, potential synergy. And it is also a rogue, and there's one card in the set that cares about rogues that we'll get to in just a second. And the second has passed, and here is Thieves Guild Enforcer. One mana for a 1-1 one, one human rogue with flash, and when the Enforcer or another rogue enters a battlefield under your control, each opponent mills two cards. And as long as an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, the Enforcer gets plus two plus one and has death touch. There's very few rogues in the set. The two mana, two one flash, and the Tavern Swindler were among some of the rogues in the sets. I don't think there's many others. So one mana for a 1-1 one, one flash, not very good. And requiring eight cards in the opponent's graveyard is not going to happen by itself. So you'll probably need to help them by milling them somehow. But uh, yeah, having to go through the effort of milling the opponent before enabling this is probably not worth it. So I'm not a huge fan of the Enforcer. Definitely has some constructed applications, but for limited, I'll give this a conservative D rating. And next up we have a Village Rights, single black for an instant, at common. As an additional cost, you have to sacrifice a creature and then draw two cards. So pretty nifty card draw spell. Can pretty easily keep up one black mana. And if the opponent tries to kill one of your creatures, you get to at least draw two cards for one mana, so it still only gets you one card ahead, but it does feel pretty good, makes you feel smart for uh, sacrificing your creature in response. Does have some potential sacrifice synergies as well, if you can combine this with the Act of Treason in, in the set here. There's one uncommon Act of Treason effect to steal one of the opponent's creatures. You can combine this with that as well. Has a lot of small little synergies, and uh, yeah, I don't hate it.
still not an incredible card, you're still potentially only netting one extra card, but it's for one mana and uh, not too difficult to keep up village rights, so I'll give it a C. And then we've got Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose, two and a black for a legendary vampire cleric. It's a 1-3 and says whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. And for three and double black, creatures you control gain lifelink until end of turn. Potentially pretty powerful card. Three mana for a 1-3, not exciting. So even giving a 1-3 a lifelink doesn't do all that much, so definitely relies on a board presence to be effective, but also synergizes with other life gain besides the lifelink that Vito provides. So it's definitely a build around card, but the payoff is potentially pretty huge. I like uh, a B, B plus on Vito, probably closer to a B, but uh, potentially also has some constructed applications. And then we've got Walking Corpse reprinted once again, two mana for a 2-2 two -two zombie, pretty simple, just a filler creature if you need a random 2-drop, this will do. And we did note a little bit of zombie synergy with uh, Liliana's Devotee that can potentially give this one additional power. So if you have a couple Devotees, this goes up in value, but generally speaking, this is probably just a D. But if you need filler 2-drops, this will do. Next up we have Witch's Cauldron, single black for an uncommon artifact. And for one on a black, we can tap it and sacrifice a creature to gain one life and draw a card. So Witch's Oven, this is not. It's still potentially serviceable in a very dedicated sacrifice deck, but as we mentioned, there's very few Act of Treason effects in the set to combo with it, and uh, that probably means this is mostly going to be relegated to the sideboard, maybe against a removal-heavy deck where you can use this to at least get a bit of value before your creatures perish, or against decks with a lot of enchantment-based removal, like the uh, Capture Sphere or Fates Feathers, so you can at least get a bit of value from your enchanted creatures. But uh, I'll give this a D, and mostly treat it as a sideboard card. Our first red card is Battle Rattle Shaman, reprinted from uh, Rise of the Eldrazi, I think, was when we first saw him. So we get a 4 mana, 2-2 two, two Goblin Shaman at Uncommon, and at the beginning of combat on our turn, we may have target creature get plus two plus so until end of turn. Not an amazing card, but at least we can potentially pump up a different creature. So if we've got a first strike creature, maybe a double strike creature, a flyer that can get in for damage, then the shaman can enable them. So it is quite a bit more flexible than just a 4-2 creature would be. So I like a C for battle rattle shaman, still not an amazing card but uh, can potentially also help out in the 4 power matters deck in red-green and has a lot of small synergies to potentially make it better. Next up we have Bolt Hound, 2 and a red for an elemental dog at uncommon and we get a 2-2 two -two haste and whenever Bolt Hound attacks other creatures we control get plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. Yeah, pretty reasonable card in an aggressive deck. We mentioned there's not really a token go white theme in the set so we do miss out on that particular synergy but if we can curve out one drop two drop into a bolt hound we are applying a ton of pressure so this definitely wants to be in some sort of red white aggro deck maybe with a bit of dog synergy so overall i'm still a fan of bolt hounds and i'm willing to give a c plus and uh, if we have to give a good boy rating this is, at the very least, a 13 out of 10. Next up we have a Bone Pit Brute, 6 mana for a 4-5 Cyclops with Menace. And when the Brute enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus 4, plus 0 until end of turn. Welcome to the club. Yeah, the Bone Pit Brute doesn't mess around. Especially nice if we can give some sort of evasive creature the plus 4 extra power, if we can translate that into 4 extra damage this card becomes a lot more appealing. And then 4-5 menace for 6. What do we expect to pay for a 4-5 menace typically? Probably around 5 mana, so we're not paying all that much more. So yeah, Bone Pit Brute seems fine. Still don't want a ton of these expensive 6 mana cards, but this is definitely playable, so I'll give it a C. Next up we have a Bresh Taunter, 
4 and a red for a 1-1 one, one goblin with indestructible. And whenever Bresh Taunter is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to target opponent. And for 2 and a red, we can tap it, and Taunter fights another target creature. So Taunter is always looking for a fight and uh, can deal quite a bit of damage to the opponent, especially if they control a high-powered creature. And 1-1 one, one Indestructible, pretty difficult to get past. There's a few ways to kill it, uh, namely in black we saw Grasp of Darkness can get around Indestructible, giving it minus 4, minus 4. And uh, at Uncommon we also had the minus 2, minus 2 sweeper effects that could potentially take it out, Pestilent Haze. So those are two pretty straightforward ways of getting rid of the Brash Taunter. But outside of black it's a lot more difficult. And uh, yeah, the ability can definitely be quite punishing against some decks in particular. Taunter seems quite good, and uh, I'm willing to give it a B+. Definitely up there. Next up we have Burn Bright, reprinted from Ravnica Legions. Two and a red for an instant, giving creatures we control plus two plus so until end of turn. Now in Ravnica Legions, there wasn't really a go-wide aggro deck, but we did have the gimmicky Goblin Gathering deck to potentially make a bunch of tokens and combo with Burn Bright and Cavalcade. Don't really see that in Corsa 2021, so I'm hesitant to include Burn Bright in any aggressive decks, although maybe like the red-white aggro deck with a bunch of one-drops this could be okay. Still seems like a card that's gonna be cut more often than not, so that's the definition of a D. We also have Chandra, Heart of Fire, 3 and double red for a 5 loyalty Chandra at Mythic Rare, plus 1 to discard our hand and then exile the top 3 of our library and until end of turn we can play those cards. And then the second plus 1 deals 2 damage to any target. And then the ultimate has a lot of text, doesn't seem super relevant for limited. So we're mostly going to be using the various plus one abilities, but we do get five loyalty, goes up to six right away, so pretty difficult to get rid of. So we can expect to untap with Chandra at least once, and uh, a plus ability that deals two damage can definitely take out lots of creatures from the opponent. So Chandra seems great. Not the best Chandra we've ever seen, but definitely not the worst. So I like an A for Chandra, quite powerful with a good plus one ability that sort of protects itself, just a bit weak to very large green creatures, I guess. Then we've got Chandra's Incinerator, six mana for a 6-6 six, six elemental at rare, with Trample, and it costs X less to cast, where X is the total amount of non-combat damage dealt to our opponents this turn. Not too many ways of doing that, got a couple burn spells, couple creatures that can ping the opponent, but for the most part we're going to be paying around 5 or 6 mana for the Incinerator, and then whenever a source we control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, the Incinerator deals that much damage to target a creature or planeswalker that player controls. So if we do happen to have some burn spells to go face or some pinger creatures, we can also deal a bit of damage to their creatures. Overall, still pretty pricey, but we are getting a 6-6 six, six Trample in red, which doesn't always get the biggest creatures. Of course, if we get to live the dream of playing a couple burn spells and playing this for 4 mana, this could be quite powerful. Realistically, it's probably going to be closer to 5 or 6. And at that point, it does lose a bit of its excitement, but definitely a card that could have some applications in older formats in burn decks. I'll give uh, Incinerator a C+, maybe B-, minus. not quite sure where it falls in that range. Next up we have a Chandra's Magmut, one and a red for a 2-2 elemental dog, and we can tap the Magmut to deal one damage to target player or planeswalker. So this is, for instance, a way we can reduce the cost on Chandra's Incinerator. And uh, yeah, a nice two drop can potentially attack once or twice early on, and if a board stall happens, we can just start pinging the opponents using the tap ability. So Big fan of the Magmut, give it a C+, and we'll give it a good boy rating of a 12 out of 10. Then we've got a Chandra's Powerling, 1 and a red for a 1-3 Elemental Lizard at Uncommon, 
and whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, the Powerling gets plus one plus one and gains double strike until end of turn. So this combo is quite well with the Magmut we just covered. I do think I prefer the Magmut and the Enabler in general over the payoff here, but the Powerling is still potentially playable, especially if we have a lot of ways to enable it. can potentially enable it multiple times, and uh, of course giving additional power to double strike does scale pretty well. So I like a C for the Powerling. Definitely prefer the Magmut, but Powerling could still combo well with it. Then we've got Conspicuous Snoop, double rat for a Goblin Rogue at rare. It's a 2-2. While well, we have to play with the top card of our library revealed, so our opponent also gets to see it. And we may cast Goblin spells from the top of our library. And as long as the top card of our library is a Goblin card, the Snoop has all activated abilities of that card. So I've looked at the entire set, and there's very few Goblins. There's a Goblin Arsonist at 1 mana, there's the Battle Rattle Shaman at 4 that we saw earlier, and uh, I think that's about it, there might be one more. But yeah, not very many Goblins. So this is mostly a constructed uh, printing with a lot of combo potential in older formats and potentially also a fine addition for Historic Goblins. For Standard, this is a difficult to cast 2-2, with potentially the downside of revealing the top card of your deck. Yeah, not a fan of the Snoop, I'll give it a D. Next up we have Crash Through, a nice reprint. Seen it a few times now, first in Our Devastation and then M19. Single red for Sorcery, creatures we control gain Trample on ton of turn, and we get to draw a card. So this is perfect as a way to enable the Blue Rat Prowess and the Spells Matters deck as a cheap cantrip. The Stormwing Entity we can potentially play on the cheap thanks to Crash Through. Probably not as good as Opts as far as cantrips go, but still at the very least a C. Then we've got Destructive Tampering. Two and a red for a sorcery. Add common that can destroy an artifact or creatures without flying can block this turn. Reprinted from Ether Revolt where it was sometimes played in aggressive decks just as a finisher for the second mode. And of course in Aether Revolt you had a couple artifacts, so the first mode was used more often. This time around, not too many artifacts in the set. The second ability could still be a relevant finisher, but probably not going to make the deck very often. So that's the definition of a D. Then we've got Double Vision. Three and double red for a... Rare enchantment saying whenever we cast our first instant or sorcery spell each turn, copy that spell and we can choose new targets for the copy. Pretty expensive enchantments and uh, some instants and sorceries aren't all that great if we copy them. And uh, we also need to have sufficient instants and sorceries to copy in the first place. So not a fan of double vision. I'm sure there's going to be a deck where this is going to be okay, where we have a lot of removal spells and card draw spells that we can double. So probably going to be at its best in blue reds is my guess, where we've got a bit of card draw in blue. But uh, yeah, still pretty pricey, requires a lot of setup. So I'll give it a D, but could definitely see decks where it's going to be an overperformer. And then we've got Fiery Emancipation, 3 and triple red for a mythic rare enchantment, saying if a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals triple that damage to that permanent or player instead. Can triple any damage output essentially. So it triples the damage from creatures, and if you've got any burn spells or planeswalkers that deal damage, those deal triple damage as well. So it does mostly apply to red cards when it comes to the non-creature half, but for creatures this uh, doesn't care whether it's red or a different uh, color. It does require you to have a deck with a lot of creatures slash burn spells to take advantage, but that seems like a pretty easy requirement to meet and uh, has an immediate impact the turn we play it, attack and deal a ton of damage. So I'm a fan of Emancipation, I'm giving this an A. Furious Rise, 2 and a red for a uncommon enchantment reprinted from Theros Beyond Death, so not too long ago. And at the beginning of your end step, if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, exile top card from your library, and you may play that card until you exile another card with Furious Rise. Pretty interesting way of drawing additional cards for a red deck, 
gonna be at its best in the red green power four matter deck basically and uh yeah it's not a bad card draw engine definitely ended up being pretty good in theros in the right deck not gonna be great in any red deck but as we'll see in a second there's quite a few cheap four powered creatures even starting at three mana to enable furious rise and uh, other various synergies so i like uh, c plus for furious rise next up we have furor of the bitten one mana enchantment aura reprinted from original innistrad and the enchanted creature gets plus two plus two and has to attack each combat if able so this is a versatile enchantment in that we can both enchant our own creature but we can also technically enchant the opponent's creature and force it to attack although putting this on the opponent's creature is pretty tricky to make work because you kind of need to have a bigger blocker to then eat the opponent's creature and can potentially go poorly if the opponent has a combo trick or a removal spell. So it's mostly going to be used on your own creature. And of course we're playing an aura which can get two for ones. We don't get any additional ability like first strike or flying. So not a huge fan of Fear of the Bitten. That being said, definitely has a place in some very aggressive decks. So I'll give this a D but uh, could see some play in the hyper-aggressive decks. Then we've got the Gadrak, the Crown Scourge, two and a red for a legendary dragon at rare, and it's a 5-4 flyer, but Gadrak can't attack unless you control four or more artifacts, and there's not too many artifacts in the set as we've seen, but then of course Gadrak enables itself with, at the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each non-token creature that died this turn. Gadrak may not be able to attack right away, but definitely can block right away. In terms of a 3 mana 5 4 flyer that can block, it's not that bad. Like, there's not many creatures in the early game that can attack past Gadrak unopposed. So, it does do a good job of protecting your life total. And then eventually, some creatures might end up dying, maybe get a couple treasures. Even if you never attack with Gadrak and just have it be a 5-4 that makes one or two treasures to help you ramp and then ends up trading away for a larger creature from the opponent, that still seems like a fine deal. There's not many scenarios where Gadrak is useless. Maybe the opponent has like an unblockable creature out and this doesn't do anything, but there's not many of those in the set. So Gadrak seems quite good, at the very least a B. Then we've got Goblin Arsonist reprinted, one mana for a 1-1 one, one Goblin Shaman, and when the Arsonist dies, we may have a deal 1 damage to any target. So, nice little creature, potentially plays well in the Sacrifice Synergy decks in Rakdos. So, yeah, Arsonist is a fine card, nothing exciting, but if you need something cheap, or some Sacrifice fodder, this will do. So I'll give this a C. Then we've got Goblin Wizardry. Three and a red for an instant at common that creates two one one red goblin wizard creature tokens with prowess. Pretty interesting that this is an instant. You're probably not super happy to ambush creatures with the one one prowess tokens considering you paid four mana for it. But I guess it's just upside that this is an instant. So I guess you want to play this in the blue red spells deck where we've got a bunch of ways to enable prowess and cards that care about instants and sorceries in the graveyard. Still doesn't seem great, but it is playable. Probably closer to a C for me than anything else. Then we've got Havoc Jester, four and a red for an uncommon devil, it's a 5-5, five five. and whenever we sacrifice a permanent, Jester deals one damage to any target. So the ability is slightly less powerful than that of Mayhem Devil, since it's only looks at uh, permanents you sacrifice, doesn't look at the opponent. 5 mana 5-5 five, five in red is decent, and then uh, the ability can definitely deal 1 damage here and there. Couple sacrifice outlets to combo with it, so gonna be at its best in red-black. So I like C plus on Havoc Jester. Then we've got Hardfire Immolator, 1 and a red for a human wizard at uncommon. It's a 2-2 two, two and it has prowess. So 2 mana for a 2-2 with prowess is already pretty decent. And uh, 
then there's more. For one red mana we can sacrifice the Immolator to deal damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker. So it doesn't quite go face, but can take out potentially some large creatures if we enable prowess often enough. So I like Immolator quite a bit. Willing to give this a B. Next up we've got Hellkind Punisher, 7 mana for a 6-6 dragon at uncommon with flying and has the classic fire breathing ability. 1 red mana to give it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. It is expensive at 7 mana, but it does end the game in 1 or 2 attacks. So that's pretty much all you can ask for from your 7 drops. So I'll give uh, Punisher C+. Can't afford to play too many of these 7 drops, but this is definitely not the worst one. Then we've got Hobble Fiend, 1 and a red for a Devil at common, 2 on Trample, and we can spend 1 mana and sacrifice another creature to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So the payoff here is not huge, a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a 2 on Trample is uh, not super exciting, and as we mentioned there's not that many active treason effects to synergize with it. And a 2 1 trample, nothing to write home about. So I'll give this a C. It's definitely playable, but nothing exciting. Next up, we have Igneous Cur, 1 and a red for an elemental dog at common. And it's a 1 2, and for 1 and a red, the Igneous Cur gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. And remember, this is the elemental dog we can search up with the red white uncommon, the Alpine Houndmaster. It is nice that the Boros Uncommon can search up a 2-drop that's still relevant in the late game, because we do get a nice mana sync ability here. So despite being a 2-drop, it's still gonna hold its own later in the game, and the rate at which we can pump it is pretty efficient. So it doesn't get in a ton of damage unpumped, but it does scale relatively well into the late game. So I don't mind the Igneous Cur. Probably give this a C and a good boy rating of 11 out of 10. Next up we have Kinetic Augur, 3 and a red for an uncommon human shaman and has 4 toughness, comes with trample and its power is equal to the number of instant and sorcery cards in our graveyard. This wants to go in the blue red spells deck with a bunch of cheap 1 mana and 2 mana cantrips that end up in the graveyard. And then when the Augur enters the battlefield, we can discard up to two cards and then draw that many cards. So it can get rid of lands or maybe just put some instants and sorceries in the graveyard to make it bigger. And it does come with Trample, so decent stats, a nice ability, but it is a build around. It's not going to be great in every deck, but in a dedicated blue-red spells deck, this could be pretty strong. So I like uh, C plus on Kinetic Augur. And then we've got Onake Ogre, reprinted once again. So we've got a 3 mana 4-2 Ogre Warrior, pretty simple. But it does enable some nice synergies in the set with all those 4 power matters cards in red-green. So this is a good way to get those cards going. And uh, yeah, 4-2 doesn't mess around. If the opponent doesn't have a 2-drop to trade off, then they're going to have to trade something relevant or take 4 damage which they can't do over and over again. So, yeah, still not an amazing card, but definitely has a role to play in the 4 Power Matters deck. So I'll give Onake Ogre a C. And Pitch Burn Devils returns once again, first seen in the original Innistrad. 5 mana for a 3-3 Devil, and when the Pitch Burn Devil dies, it deals 3 damage to any target. So, definitely a card that plays better than it looks. 5 mana 3-3 three, three at first doesn't seem great, but the ability to deal 3 damage definitely adds up, can take out some pretty large creatures with the ability, can still potentially sacrifice it to an effect and get 3 damage out of it, so you're still getting most of a card worth of value even if you sacrifice it, and uh, you can block a 6 toughness creature and still kill it, and if you need to attack it still gets in 3 damage, so... It's deceptively powerful, and uh, I think I'm giving this a C+. Then we've got another Sanctum. Sanctum of Shattered Heights, 2 and a red for a Legendary Enchantment Shrine at Uncommon. And for 1 mana we can discard a land card or shrine card. 
and then Sanctum deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker where X is the number of shrines we control. So by itself this is pretty bad. In the dedicated shrine deck maybe this starts doing something, but uh, I wouldn't get my hopes up. So I'll give this a conservative D rating, but hopefully we'll end up uh, drafting the shrine deck at some point and uh, this will play a role in that. Next up we've got Scorching Dragonfire, reprinted from Throne of Eldraine not too long ago. One in red for an instant at common, deals 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker, and if that creature or planeswalker dies, instead it gets exiled. So a pretty efficient removal spell. There's a couple of cards that uh, care about ending up in the graveyard or returning from the graveyard, which Dragonfire can shut down, so the exile ability is definitely a lot more relevant than it might appear at first glance. And uh, yeah, incredibly efficient at just 2 mana, so I like a B for Scorching Dragonfire. We've got a reprint of Shock, this time with the different art. Single red to deal 2 damage to any targets, at instant speed can also go face. So just a classic from Magic's history. And yeah, still good all these years later and uh, combines especially nicely in the blue-red spells deck as a way to enable prowess for one mana, as a way to potentially discount the Stormwing Entity that we uh, covered. So pretty good card, and uh, yeah, the flexibility of going face can also come up if you need to finish off an opponent. Probably not as good as the Scorching Dragonfire that we just covered, but it's not too far behind, so if not a B minus, at least a C plus, just a very solid card. Soul Seer is next to an red for an instant at uncommon, dealing five damage to target creature or planeswalker, and that permanent loses indestructible until end of turn. So even the indestructible cards aren't safe from Soul Seer, and I believe we've seen two indestructible cards so far. We had the artifacts massacre, and then we had the uh, white, uncommon, the seasoned Hallow Blade. So those are the two indestructible cards we've seen so far. And yeah, five damage for three mana is uh, pretty decent, I guess. Yeah, you're right, this also shuts down the rare Brash Taunter that we saw earlier in red. So pretty nice answer to that as well. But of course you will be dealing five damage to it, so it's gonna hurt. But uh, yeah, still an answer nevertheless. Pretty similar in power level to Scorching Dragonfire, we're paying one extra mana but we're getting two extra damage out of the deal and some additional utility against Indestructible, so I like a B on Soul Seer as well. We've got a reprint of Spellgorger Weird from War of the Spark, two and a red for a Weird at common, and whenever we cast a non-creature spell we can put a plus one plus one counter on a 2-2. Two -two. So scales pretty nicely into the late game, especially in the blue-red spells deck that I keep bringing up. And uh, most red decks are going to have a healthy amount of instants and sorceries and other various non-creature spells to enable it. So pretty good, definitely a card that tends to overperform. So I like C plus on Spellgorge or Weird. Then we have Subira, Tulzidi, Caravanner, Twin Red for a rare, legendary Human Shaman. It's a 2-3 with haste, and for one mana another target creature with power 2 or less can be blocked this turn. So nice evasive ability. And then for one and a red we can tap Subira and discard our hand, hopefully our hand is mostly empty. And then until end of turn, whenever a creature we control with power 2 or less deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So for empty handed we can use this to refuel. And yeah, the ability to get our creatures in for evasive damage over and over again. It's definitely pretty nice. So powerful rare and can definitely single-handedly carry a game if there's a board stall happening. So I like a B for Subira. Sure Strike is back and uh, yeah, probably still a pretty decent combo trick as it usually is. One in a red to give target creature plus three plus O and first strike until end of turn at instant speed. So it can help you take out pretty large creatures, even with just a small creature getting pumped by it. And first strike means 
the trade's going to go in your favor without losing any of your creatures, which is important. So pretty solid combo trick. Happy giving this at least a C. Terror of the Peaks. 5 mana for a 5-4 Mythic Rare Dragon with flying. Spells your opponent's cast that target the Terror. Costs additional 3 life to cast. So at the very least it's going to leave a nice big scar. And whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. So it can go face, can take out creatures. So basically if you get to untap with Terror of the Peaks, you essentially won the game. Yeah, this card seems very good. Even if the opponent can remove it, they're losing a bit of life. And the way they remove it is also important if they use Face Feathers or Capture Sphere. You still get the passive ability, so it's not a great answer to the Terror of the Peaks. So this card seems quite good and uh, worthy of an S rating. One of the few cards with an S rating so far. Next up we have Thrill of Possibility, once again. Reprinted a few times now, one on a red for an instant, and as an additional cost, discard a card to draw two cards. So a nice way to mitigate Flood in late game, discard lands, draw two cards. Good way to enable the various blue red uh, spells matters decks and uh, enable prowess at instant speed. So pretty solid card. Always happy to have at least one copy and some decks might even want multiples. I like C for thrill of possibility. Then we've got traitorous greed. This was the act of treason effect I was talking about. The only one in the set I could find. Three in a red for an uncommon sorcery. Gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature, gains haste until end of turn. And the novelty here is that we get to add two mana of any one color. So we can use that mana to maybe play some other spells right away. Or we can use it on an activated ability to sacrifice the creature we just stole. If we don't have the mana otherwise before attacking. Set has a lot of sacrifice outlets, so that makes these act of treason effects more desirable but unless you have some sacrifice outlets to combo with it you're probably not super interested so i'll still just give this a c but in the red black sacrifice deck this is probably going to be pretty valuable then we've got transmogrify three and a red for a sorcery at rare exile target creature that creature's controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card Put that card onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. This is not a very good removal spell. This is more of a combo enabler in Constructed, where you play a deck with very few creatures and you're guaranteed to hit something very expensive by maybe exiling a token. For limited purposes, using this on your own creature is going to give you pretty varied results. Using this on the opponent's creature, maybe if they have a bomb, you can downgrade it into something smaller but it's still pretty inefficient. So overall, Transmogrify gets a D. Then we have Turn to Slag, reprinted. Once again, 5 mana for a sorcery, dealing 5 damage to target creature and destroying all equipment attached to that creature. We've seen two equipment so far, I believe, Short Sword and then the Scythe in black. So this is a way of punishing those. I'm not sure why it was necessary, but I guess uh, here we are. But just by itself, 5 mana for 5 damage, a playable removal spell, not particularly efficient, but uh, you'll still take it. So gets a C plus from me. Then we've got a reprint of Turret Ogre, 3 and a red for a 4-3 Ogre Warrior with reach, and when it enters the battlefield, if you control another creature with power 4 or greater, it deals 2 damage to each opponent. So another card for the 4 power matters theme in red-green. Nice if you can curve turn 3 Onake Ogre into a turn 4 Turret Ogre. And uh, yeah, overall pretty solid card. Gives red to reach as well, which it doesn't get very often. So, decent card. Give it a C. Then we've got Unleash Fury, 1 and a red for an instant at uncommon. Doubling the power of target creature until end of turn. So, at first this might seem reasonable. The more you think about it, the more you realize this is probably worse than Sure Strike. Doubling power means it potentially has more upside when it comes to dealing damage to the opponent's face than Sure Strike, but when it comes to trading creatures in combat, 
typically you're going to be better off with sure strike giving plus three and first strike so yeah not a huge fan of unleash fury i'll give this a d and then we've got volcanic geyser also reprinted a few times x and double rat for an instant and uncommon dealing x damage to any target so not a very efficient card if we're playing it for x equals a small amount but the reason this is potentially a decent card is if we start casting it for x equals four or more basically if we can cast it for very large amounts this can take out big creatures but it can also go face which is important so this can be a finisher in the late game if you've got a ton of mana so potentially quite good if you can combine it with a bit of ramp still not the most efficient card and only really shines in the late game so i can't give it too high of a grade but i'll give this a c then we've got volcanic salvo 10 and double red so 12 mana total for a sorcery at rare but it costs x less to cast where x is the total power of creatures we control so very similar to how galta discounts its mana cost as well and then volcanic salvo deals six damage to each of up to two target creatures and or planeswalkers so this deals six damage to two different targets so we don't have to divide the six damage so we can potentially take out two six toughness creatures so potentially pretty powerful two for one removal spell but it does hinge on the fact that you do need to have a bit of a board presence imagine you have a random 2-2, a random 3-3, and some other 1 power creature, let's say 6 power total. Not an uncommon board state to have. And then this will cost you 6 mana. So for 6 mana we get to take out 2 relatively big creatures from the opponent. Can also deal damage to planeswalkers for what it's worth. We've seen quite a few removal spells that can target planeswalkers, which I guess is a nice change of pace. So another reason to maybe undervalue Planeswalkers slightly in this expansion compared to previous ones. But overall Volcanic Salvo seems pretty solid. Not too difficult to get a nice 2 for 1 out of it. And uh, usually not going to be too expensive to cast. So I'll give this a B. Azusa, Lost But Seeking, 2 and a green for a 1-2 Legendary Human Monk, saying we may play 2 additional land cards on each of our turns. So for limited, this card is pretty much useless. You're not going to end up with enough lands in hand to make use of the ability. Reliably, maybe you get to play like one or two extra lands at most. So this is mostly card for constructed. Don't even think this is going to be amazing in standard. Maybe has an application in the Experimental Frenzy red-green decks. Could be pretty fun there. But for the most part, this is more of a reprint for a monetary value i guess so i'll give this an f for limited next up we have brawl fist oak two and double green for an uncommon tree folk saying whenever you draw a card the oak gets plus two plus two until end of turn and starts out as a two three so in the opponent's turn it's not going to be all that threatening but in your turn it's at the very least a four five and can potentially get bigger and potentially even at instant speed especially if you're blue green so quite a threat of activation so i like a pretty high rating for the oak i'll go up to a c plus for it seems like a pretty solid card canopy stalker four mana for a 4-2 cat and uncommon must be blocked if able and when a stalker dies you gain one life for each creature that died this turn so not particularly efficient it doesn't say every creature must block it just has to be blocked so if the opponent has one blocker that they want to block with then they can choose that one they don't have to block with any specific creature and two toughness trades off pretty easily so you kind of have to back this up with combo tricks to make it worthwhile and then you're still just one for oneing so it doesn't seem amazing but i guess it's a four powered creature for the four power matters decks yeah, I'll give this a D. Then we've got Colossal Dreadmaw. It uh, finds a way. Six mana for a 6-6 six, six common dinosaur with trample. And uh, yeah, it's not bad. If you need a curve topper, this will do. Nothing exciting, but it's there if you need it. Now, there's not a ton of ramp in the sets. We saw the Palladium Mirror at Uncommon, but there's not that many common ramp cards in green. A fine card, I'll give this a C. 
And speaking of ramp, here's Cultivate. 3 mana for a sorcery, although this one's not uncommon even. Let's just search our library for up to 2 basic land cards, reveal them, one on the battlefield tapped and the other into our hand. So definitely nice 2 for 1, we get to ramp and put an extra land into our hand, maybe fix our mana. So big fan of this card, but you do want to be ramping towards something or maybe splashing a third color and using this for fixing. But uh, pretty good at doing so. So I like C plus on Cultivate. Then we've got Drowsing Tyranodon, one and a green for a dinosaur at common. So it's a 3-3 defender and as long as you control a creature with power 4 or greater it can attack as though it didn't have defender. So plays defense early on until you're ready to start attacking. So it's not a bad little card. The green decks sometimes struggle in the early game since it's all about playing big expensive creatures and sometimes you end up taking a bit too much damage early on. This can definitely mitigate that and then still turns into a 3-3 attacker eventually once you start playing bigger stuff. So I like C plus on Pteranodon. Well, Baneslayer Angel definitely has some competition at 5 mana. Elder Gargaroth, 5 mana for a 6-6 mythic rare beast with vigilance, reach and trample. And when a Gargaroth attacks or blocks, Choose one between making a 3-3 beast, gaining 3 life, or drawing a card. I think this is better than Baneslayer Angel, although they're both quite good. So this might push it all the way up to an S. Yeah, we'll give Gargaroth an S, so joins the club. Pretty limited club so far of Terror of the Peaks and Massacre Worm. And uh, Ugin was the other S rating we gave so far. And that's probably going to be the last one, is my guess. And then we've got Feline Sovereign, 2 and a green for a 2-3 cat at rare. And other cats you control get plus 1 plus 1 and have protection from dogs. And whenever one or more cats you control deal combat damage to a player, destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment that player controls. This has similar vibes to the pack leader giving uh, other dogs plus one plus one and another useful ability. Three mana, two, three. Not horrible stats and there's a few additional cats in the set. Although not as many as we had dogs. So yeah, I'll give this a C plus, fine card. Fierce Empath is back, two and a green for a one, one elf at uncommon. And when the Empath enters the battlefield, search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost six or greater reveal it, put it into your hand, and shuffle your library. So, funnily enough, this can't get the Elder Gargaroth, because it's just too cheap. I guess Power Creep made this card a bit worse, in a weird sense. But uh, still gets Colossal Dreadmaw, so we can rest assured. And uh, yeah, a couple other expensive creatures this could search up. Some other powerful rares, maybe. Could play well with uh, some of the blue cards we've seen, like the Pursued Whale, or we had uh, Waker of the Waves. So there's a couple neat creatures that you can search up with it. And uh, you're getting a 1-1 one, one to boot to maybe chum block with. So yeah, fine card, kind of a 2 for 1 if you built your deck correctly. So I like C plus on the Empath. Fungal Rebirth is an uncommon for 2 and a green at instant speed, returning a target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. And if a creature died this turn, you get to make two 1-1 one, one green sapperling creature tokens. So it might require a bit of finagling to get the creature tokens out of the deal. And uh, green has lots of permanence, so it shouldn't be too difficult. So yeah, I like C plus on Fungal Rebirth, not too difficult to get a nice bit of value out of it. Then we've got Garruk Unleashed, our final Planeswalker for M21. 2 and double green for a 4 mana, 4 loyalty, Garruk Planeswalker, plus 1 ability, says up to 1 target creature gets plus 3 plus 3 and gains trample until end of turn. Alright, not bad, nice way to pump up a creature maybe, but the ability we're most interested in is the minus 2, creating a 3-3 green beast creature token, and then if an opponent controls more creatures than you do, put a loyalty counter on Garruk. So I like this mechanic quite a bit. Seems like a nice design. If you're behind on board, you get a bit of additional loyalty, but if you're ahead, it's going to be a bit more expensive. 
So seems pretty well balanced and still seems quite strong, making multiple beast tokens. And then you'll have to plus a few times before you can make more beast tokens, but those beasts do start adding up and it's only a four mana investment. So seems pretty powerful, definitely worthy of an A rating. Then we've got Garrox Gorehorn, five mana for a seven three beast, full stop. So by itself, this isn't great. If you can give a trample somehow, there's a few ways to do it. This becomes more interesting. There's a few cards that care about high powered creatures that can synergize with it. But generally speaking, this is probably a D. Then we've got Garrox Harbinger, one and double green for a beast with hexproof from black. So this isn't protection from black, but hexproof from black. So that means it can be targeted by black removal spells, essentially. And it's a 4-3. And when the Harbinger deals combat damage to a player or Planeswalker, look at that many cards from the top of your library, and you may reveal a creature card or a Garruk Planeswalker cards from among them and put it into your hands. And the rest goes on the bottom. So, yeah, seems decent. Even just a 3 mana 4-3 is already slightly above average and then hexproof from black is a nice bonus and then the ability if you can ever connect can provide a nice bit of card advantage and definitely incentivizes you for giving this evasion somehow or getting it through for damage so i like a b for the garrox harbinger and just a second ago when talking about garrox gorehorn I was talking about giving it Trample and Garrix Uprising is one way to potentially do it. A 3-mana enchantment at uncommon when Uprising enters a battlefield if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, draw a card. Alright, so we already want to have something in play, but then creatures we control have Trample, and whenever a creature with power 4 or greater enters a battlefield under our control, we draw a card. So this draws cards if we already have something in play, and we'll keep drawing cards if we keep playing more big creatures out. So this is another great incentive for the 4 Power Matters theme. So another nice card draw engine alongside Furious Rise in red. And this is pretty comparable, I think, to Furious Rise, maybe even slightly better. So I'll give this a C plus as well. Then we've got Gnarled Sage, 3 and double green for a 4-4 Treefolk Druid with Reach. And as long as you have drawn two or more cards this turn, the Sage gets plus O plus 2 and has Vigilance. So, yeah, nice card for the blue-green deck that can reliably draw additional cards. But even just with the Garrox Uprising that we just covered, this is a way to give the Sage Vigilance and attack as a 4-6, which pretty hard to kill in combat, and then can hold off any pesky flyers, which green can sometimes struggle with. So, pretty solid card. Probably still just a C, but could potentially get closer to C plus in uh, some decks. Then we've got another reprint with Heroic Intervention. One and a green for an instance at rare, saying permanence you control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So this is mostly meant as a sideboard card for green decks to bring in against sweeper heavy control decks. Does have some applications in limited, of course. It still has relevant text, protecting from removal, protecting your creatures from combats. If you're using this in the middle of combats, it is a card that requires a bit of setup. It's not pumping any of your creatures, so it's probably better on defense than it is on offense, where you can set up better blocks and take out creatures from the opponent, as opposed to the other way around. It is a bit conditional. It is two mana, so. Not always easy to keep up two mana all the time, but the potential is there if the circumstances are right. I'm still not a huge fan of it. I think people are probably going to overvalue it. So probably land somewhere on a C for Heroic Intervention. It's not amazing, but it's definitely playable. Just the question is, how often are you going to find room for this in your deck? And I think the answer is not very often. Then we've got Hunter's Edge, 3 in the green for a sorcery at common, saying put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature you control, and then the creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. 
So this is an improved Hunter Week, as instead of fighting, it just deals damage equal to its power, so there's no risk of getting blown out. So Hunter's Edge seems quite good. Probably going to be the premier removal spell in green, so I'm giving this a B. Invigorating Surge is 2 and a green for an instant at Uncommon, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature you control, and then double the number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on that creature. So without any additional synergies, this essentially puts two plus one plus one counters on one creature. So it's comparable to the three mana aura that we saw recently giving a plus two plus two at instant speed. And that card was pretty decent. We did have a bit of synergy in that expansion too with uh, Season of Growth, which made it a bit better. But uh, it was still a decent card. Now this potentially has even more upsides than that aura because we have a set with a few plus one plus one counter synergies. If the creature already had counters on it, it gets even more counters on it. And if we are lucky enough to be in a green-white deck with the Conclave Mentor, then this puts counters on it in two different instances. We put a counter on it, the Conclave Mentor says put an additional counter on it, and then when this says double the number of counters, we put an additional counter on top. So that's a lot of counters. So that's of course a dream in some sort of green-white plus one counter deck. But even outside of it, it's still okay. Now, I'm maybe overselling this with my explanation. It's still just kind of a combo trick that kind of lasts on the creature. Can of course get blown out by removal sometimes. So it's still not an incredible card, but I'll give this a C. Definitely a playable card. Then we've got Joel Rael, Monvuli, Recluse, one and a green for a legendary human druid at rare. It's a 1-2 saying whenever we draw your second card each turn, make a 2-2 green cat creature token. So this fits perfectly in the blue-green archetype where we've got a bunch of card draw. And uh, yeah, those tokens can definitely get out of hand. And then for six mana, until end of turn, creatures we control have base power and toughness XX, where X is the number of cards in our hand. That ability, I'm not quite sure how good it's going to be. So we shouldn't look too much at the ability, but just the fact that we're making a bunch of cat tokens seems quite powerful. And then I guess in a sense, by drawing more cards, we also enable the second ability in the late game. So very strong card, and uh, of course going to be at its best in the blue-green archetype, because without any additional card draw, it doesn't do all that much. So I like a B for Jill Ryle. Pretty strong card. Then we have Life Goes On, reprinted from Hour of Devastation. Potentially a sideboard option against burn decks, but that's about it. So strictly sideboard material and probably not even for limited. So I'll give this a D. A Lenore Visionary I'm a fan of. Two and a green for an Elf Druid at common. And when it enters the battlefield to draw cards and then taps to add green. And it's a 2-2. So it's Elvish Visionary stabled onto a Lenore Elves. And both of those cards are great, and this is no different. And as we mentioned, there's not a ton of ramp in this set. And especially in green, which usually gets quite a bit of ramp, this is one of the few options. So that makes it even more valuable. So I like at least a C plus on the Lenore Visionary. Big fan. Then we've got Ornery Dilophosaur. Three and a green for a 2-2 dinosaur with Death Touch. And whenever the Dilophosaur attacks, if we control a creature with power 4 or greater, the Dilophosaur gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. Typically we expect to pay 3 mana for a 2-2 two -two Death Touch in green. We've seen that in some previous expansions. Uh, so we're paying 1 more mana, and then we have the potential of attacking as a 4-4. Four -four. Not an exciting card, but uh, in the 4 Power Matter deck especially, so red-green I'm thinking, this is probably going to be better than average, but uh, probably give this a C. Then we've got Portcullis Vine, reprinted from Gills of Ravnica, where it was mostly used in the undergrowth decks as an enabler to end up in the graveyard. And once again, this is going to be an enabler for the Golgari decks. So this is one green mana for an O3 defender, and for two mana we can tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. So not an impressive card. It's always fine since it replaces itself at the very least but we're mostly interested in this as a way to enable some of the death triggers. The Twinblade Assassins can potentially draw an extra cards when 
we sacrifice the vine and Liliana's devotee that can make a zombie. So those are the types of synergies we're trying to enable with vine, but uh, they're still pretty marginal and definitely not an exciting card to include. So this is probably a D at best. Then we've got a Pride Malkin, two and a green for a 2-1 cat. And when it enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. And each creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it has trample. Pretty strange card. I don't really see how this uh, small cat is a potential 3-2 trampler, but I guess I'll take it. So yeah, Pride Malkin is going to be at its best in the green-white plus one plus one counter synergy decks. And uh, the default case, if you don't have another creature, is a 3-2 trample essentially. So that's not too bad for three mana. Seems like a reasonable card, probably just to see. But uh, it's going to potentially be even better in those green-white plus one plus one counter decks. Then we've got Primal Might, X and green for a sorcery at rare. Target creature you control gets plus X plus X until end of turn. And then it fights up to one target creature you don't control. So both a pump spell and removal spell. Just have to be careful not to get blown out at instant speed by an opposing removal spell. But uh, yeah, seems pretty powerful. Probably give this a B. Then we've got Creon Dryad reprinted once again. How the Mighty Have Fallen used to be a rare, and now it's downgraded to an uncommon. And uh, yeah, one and a green for a 1-1 Dryad, saying whenever we cast a spell that's a white, blue, black, red, put a plus one plus one counter on the Dryad. So this is not going to be at its best in a heavy green ramp deck with four power matters. This is probably going to be at its best in the blue-green uh, kind of draw synergy decks where we're going to be playing a bunch of cheap cantrips in blue that can all put plus one plus one counters on the Korean Dryad. That's where I imagine this is at its best. Maybe in the green-white plus one plus one counter decks this has a bit of overlap as well. So those are probably the two color combinations where the Dryad is going to shine. But pretty much any deck that's just touching a bit of green without going super deep is going to be fine with a Dryad. So yeah, C plus seems fine for Aquarian Dried, fine card. Next up we've got a Ranger's Guile, also reprinted a few times. One mana combo trick, giving a creature plus one plus one and hexproof until end of turn, of course at instant speed. So yeah, fine trick. Um, again, not sure how often you're going to have room in your deck to include Ranger's Guile. It's definitely a fine sideboard option against removal heavy decks, but uh, I don't think you're going to have room for it in the main deck very often, so probably fits the description of a D. Then we've got Return to Nature, reprinted once again. Used to be a very main deckable card in Theros. This time around we don't have as many enchantment creatures running around, so relegated back to the sideboard. And uh, yeah, gets a D rating, mostly just a sideboard card. We've got Run Afoul as another sideboard card, one mana at instant speed to make target opponent sacrifice a creature with flying. So I guess a nice answer to Dream Trawlers in Constructed, but just a D for limited. Sabertooth Mauler, three and a green for a 3-3 cat at common. And at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on the Sabertooth and untap it. So this is probably going to be at its best in the Golgari decks, where, as we mentioned, we have a bit of death synergy with uh, Portcullis Vine, we had the uh, Liliana's Devotee and uh, Liliana's Stewards that uh, synergize with creatures dying. So that's probably where Sabertooth is at its best. The fail case is still a pretty decent creature, a 3-3 that will grow over time and untap. Not sure if this is closer to a C or a C+. I'll start on C for the Sabertooth Mauler, since it does require a bit of setup to really get going, and a 3-3-4-4 three, three, four, four mana is a bit below the curve in this day and age, but uh, definitely a card that could surprise me and end up being closer to a C+. Then we've got Sanctum of Fruitful Harvest. we got to complete the cycle of Sanctum cards here with a 2 and a green a legendary enchantment shrine at uncommon and at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase at X mana of any one color where X is the number of shrines you control. So by itself this is kind of like a bad New Horizons type effect where uh, 
you get to add one additional mana essentially, although you can't make use of the mana the same turn you played the Sanctum. So as far as the shrines go, this is probably not the worst one. This and the black one seemed like the most playable ones, maybe the blue one gets uh, up there as well. Yeah, maybe this is another way to end up in the shrine deck, just by picking this up somewhere in the middle of the pack, and then getting some other shrines late, and then you can potentially make it work, at least that's my hope. But uh, still just a D for now. Then we've got a reprint of Scavenging Ooze, definitely a welcome addition for both standard and historic alike. One in a green for an ooze at rare, it's a 2-2, and for one green mana we can exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a creature card, put a plus one plus one counter on Scavenging Ooze and you gain one life. So an excellent little creature that will get better over time, pairs well with other removal spells, especially ones that don't exile and put the things in the graveyard. And this also stops any graveyard shenanigans, especially relevant in Constructed, but definitely it's gonna pick up some plus one plus one counters and limit it as a game naturally progresses. And yeah, it's a two drop that's still very much relevant in the late game, probably one of the best two drops around. And uh, yeah, happy to give this at least a B, if not more. Then we've got Satessan Training reprinted, first seen in Theros, and uh, one in a green for an aura that enchants a creature that we control, so we can't even target the opponent's creature with this and then draws a card when it enters the battlefield, and the enchanted creature gets plus one plus so and has trample. The reason Satessan Training was good in Theros is that we had a lot of synergy with it between the various graveyard synergies, caring about cheap things ending up in the graveyard, and between the various uh, enchantment synergies and uh, the heroic synergies as well, rewarding you for targeting some creatures. Now, we don't have those synergies anymore, so how good is the in training? It's still okay, definitely not on the same level, but it's still a very playable card, replaces itself, leaves behind a relevant uh, stat increase, and trample can be nice on some creatures. So Satas in training at the end of the day probably still gets a C, but definitely used to be much higher in Theros. Then we've got Skyway Sniper, single green for a 1-2 elf archer at uncommon, with reach, and for 2 and a green, deals 1 damage to target creature with flying. Doesn't strike me like a main deckable card, this is purely a sideboard card, and even as a sideboard card, it seems pretty underwhelming, maybe good against a swarm of 1-1 tokens, but there's not too many of those with flying. So, yeah, purely a sideboard card, and it's not even an exciting one, so this is a D. Now a snare spinner, I can get behind, if we want some main deckable anti-flying cards, as this is still fine against non-flying creatures, as a 2 mana 1 3 with reach, and when the snare spinner blocks a creature with flying, it gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn, so it can grow up to a 3 3 when blocking flyers, so it can definitely brawl with some pretty big flyers out there. And then a 2 mana 1 3 is still serviceable early on, even against non-flying creatures, especially when double blocking, so I like C for snare spinner. Sporeweb Weaver, 2 and a green for a 1-4 spider at a rare, and it has reach and hexproof from blue. So again, not protection, just hexproof, so it can be targeted by blue spells, but can definitely be blocked by blue creatures, for instance. And whenever Sporeweb Weaver is dealt damage, you gain one life and create a 1-1 green sapperling creature token. So, pretty decent creature. Plays defense quite well, annoying to get past if you don't have very large creatures. So, yeah, overall, give this a C+. We've got Thrashing Brontodon joining us once again. Another card that's quickly becoming an evergreen card in core sets and in standard. So one and double green for a 3-4 dinosaur at uncommon. And for one mana we can sacrifice it to destroy an artifact or enchantment. Great card, because of its versatility, 3 mana 3-4 three, is... Totally fine card, and then we get that additional flexibility of destroying artifacts or enchantments should it come up. So a great card in any deck, you're never gonna cut it from your green decks pretty much. And uh, yeah, happy to give this C+, B-, somewhere in that range. Titanic Growth, also reprinted, one and a green for an instant, giving target creature plus 4, plus 4 until end of turn. So pretty powerful pump spell. 
and uh, gotta watch out for those titanic growths killing you out of nowhere. Yeah, pretty decent card for an aggressive green deck and uh, a card that you're usually pretty happy to have one copy of in your main deck. So I'll give this a C. Track down one on a green sorcery at common. Scry three and then reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature or land card, draw that card. Reminiscent of uh, Adventure's Impulse, although this costs two mana. Do get to Scry three. I'm still not super excited about it, but uh, it's definitely like a playable filler card if you need a 23rd card. So this is probably a D. Next up we have Truffle Snout, 2 and a green for a 2-2 two, two boar at common, and enters the battlefield with either a plus one plus one counter or gaining four life. Three mana, three three, but it's even better than that because it has a plus one plus one counter, and as we discussed, there's a whole bunch of plus one plus one counter synergies, especially in a green-white. Makes it quite a bit better than a center courser, and we've got the flexibility of gaining a bit of life if we're maybe behind facing a bunch of flying creatures or burn spells. So Truffle Snout is great, happy to give this a C plus even, and we'll give this an honorary good boy rating of 13 out of 10. Warden of the Woods, 6 mana for a 5-7 tree folk at uncommon, with Vigilance saying whenever it becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw 2 cards. So it has a bit of built-in insurance against removal, and uh, if the opponent doesn't remove it, it's pretty difficult to get past. 5-7 Vigilance, attacks well, blocks well, and uh, yeah, you'll get some value if the opponent gets rid of it. So I like at least a C plus on Warden of the Woods. Then we've got a Wildwood Scourge, X and green for a Hydra at Uncommon, enters the battlefield with X, plus one plus one counters on it, and whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on another non-Hydra creature we control, put a plus one plus one counter on the Scourge. So this is another payoff for all those plus one plus one counters, and especially the ones that we would be playing anyway, like the Truffle Snout for instance comes to mind, and the Pride Malkin, all uh, commons in green. Those all synergize quite well with the Scourge, and of course the dream is to combine it with the green-white uncommon, the Conclave Mentor, which I've mentioned a few times now. So. Pretty decent card, happy to give this a, a C plus as well. And we're back at the beginning with Alpine Houndmaster. We've uh, assembled all the good boy ratings and uh, yeah, there's a lot of good boys in the set. So I'm looking forward to drafting some doggos. Just as a recap, if you're a patron or a Twitch subscriber, I'll uh, post my spreadsheet of this set review on the Discord server and you'll get access to it and I'll keep updating it as I keep playing some uh, M21 Limited, which seems pretty fun. Not too many overpowered cards, a reasonable amount of removal, and uh, all colors seem pretty balanced, so it looks like a pretty fun time. Then we will be playing in the Early Access events on Wednesday and we'll be going for the full 22 hours. We'll be brewing all sorts of standard decks mostly, the early access event courtesy of Wizards of the Coast. And then next week, Sunday, I'll probably be back with my next stream after the early access event. Stream fully dedicated to limited, so we'll be drafting all day long and trying out all these new cards that we just discussed. That's just about gonna wrap things up for today. Wanna thank everyone for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.